Good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the 20th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2013? Can I remind all those present to please ensure that all electronic devices are switched off at all times, if you don't mind, please? Um, our first item today is an evidence session with the Minister for Children and Young People on our inquiry into decision-making on whether to take children into care. Can I welcome to the committee this morning Aileen Campbell, Minister for Children and Young People, uh, David Blair, Head of Looked After Children Policy, and Phil Raines, Head of Child Protection uh, Scottish Government. Uh, this is the final oral evidence-taking uh, session for inquiry. Uh, we intend to publish our final reports after the summer recess. Uh, today's session, therefore, is an opportunity for members to question the Minister on the key issues that have arisen throughout our inquiry, um, including, of course, those issues that were raised uh, I think, uh, very extensively and eloquently last week at our uh, event that we held here in the Parliament. Um, good morning, Minister. Um, I, I presume you have an opening statement you'd like to make? Yes, yes, just a, a brief you. opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, Committee. Um, the Scottish Government believes that every child has the right to expect the best start in life, and in practice that means working towards narrowing the difference between the outcomes of looked-after children across a range of different indicators and children and young people in the wider population. The last several years has seen a shift in legislation and reforms to hearings, child protection and how we inspect. More and more research shows the value of early intervention, early permanence and the effectiveness of key family interventions that can arrest neglect, overcome trauma and improve outcomes. As a country, we are making tangible progress. Since 2007, we have doubled the number of adoptions from care. We have seen the proportion of children becoming looked after under the age of five increase by over 25%. Those becoming looked after under the age of one has increased by 50%. Care and quality and attainment outcomes are increasing year on year. But these are not signs that the system is in crisis or in need of radical reform. They are indicators that we are slowly but sustainably getting it right for more of our young people. But we do need to go further. We will better support, we will better support families, including those in the early stages of difficulty with measures in the Children and Young People Bill and will promote kinship care as a positive alternative to becoming looked after through the kinship care order, building on a child's existing attachments. But family breakdown is a complex issue, and the task ahead is about implementing our key frameworks and improving practice, building on the consensus about what works. This will involve setting national aspirations for social work and all corporate parents, including new ones as a result of the bill. And we need to be clearer about how we support children, families and communities. Effective interventions should follow three key principles. And those key principles should be appropriate based on evidence of what works. For example, parallel planning for every child would be transformative for children and for budgets. In addition, it is a prerequisite for improving both family and child outcomes that a long-term trusting and honest relationship is formed with the care worker. They should be proportionate, doing only what's required, but recognising that universal services in the third sector are better placed than social work to do much of the heavy lifting, for example, when supporting families with the early signs of breakdown. Investing fully in early preventative measures and so problems don't escalate, and recognising that resolution in cases of neglect might warrant long-term, low-level parenting support rather than time-limited, focused intervention. And interventions need to be timely. And that means taking responsibility for investing much earlier in families and ensuring every single child in care has a timescale relevant to that child set for determining permanence and that those are adhered to. So in summary, the challenge is about mobilising better our combined efforts and resources, putting more of it into families earlier and making it easier for practitioners to deliver involved family support and the safe, stable, nurturing and permanent home in whatever form needed by every child. So thank you for the work that the committee has done and I look forward to taking some of your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Can I begin with a couple of questions? Um, the could you explain to the committee what exactly is the government's role in terms of the decision-making processes in removing children from the home? What, what do you see as your role as Minister and what do you see as the government's role in this process? Well, I very much see our role as being that of a, a leadership role in setting out the, the guidance, the, the providing the frameworks and making sure that we provide the support to ensure that decisions that are made by the local practitioners are done so in a way that's fully informed and those practitioners are, are fully empowered. Uh, so, for example, you know, through the legislation, which I know you're taking uh, uh, evidence on later on this morning, 
we firmly want to make sure that GERFEC is put on statute to make sure that national consistency is there. We've taken a leadership role on that uh, and made sure that now the pace of change can be upped and that that consistency is there and that will be provided through through the bill. So that's one example of where I see government being uh, in a position to take a leadership role in making sure that decisions can be taken timely and that the best interests of the children that we are dealing with can be served. Given that uh, it's your view that the, the government sets out the framework, it sets out the legislation, it sets out the direction of travel um, in terms of this process, um, do you believe that all those involved in the decision-making process uh, have a shared vision of what success looks like and how we actually get there? Well, I think, you know, I think as well from your, your um, the evidence that you've taken through through the course of the, the months and, um, and, and weeks, that there are a number of different players involved with this as well. So, yes, we absolutely have to make sure that we coalesce around a shared agenda of what is in the best interest of that of that child and that's about making sure that interventions are proportionate, they're timely uh, and that they are appropriate. So making sure that the, the GERFEC framework, the best interest of the, ch interest of the child, that practitioners co coalesce around that is very much what we need to, to make sure is happening across across the country in a consistent way. And it's also why we've produced the, you know, the Common Core, for instance, to make sure that all practitioners know uh, exactly the different needs of the child, the well-being of the child and making sure that they can work together and speak the same language and making sure that we can focus on delivering delivering uh, good positive outcomes for that child, making sure that um, their well-being is at the heart of everything that they do. I ask about the shared vision question uh, very specifically because it's a question that I asked at the start of the um, event last week. Um, would it surprise you to find out that the answer amongst the around 70 professionals who were there was that uh, it was a four to one ratio who said no rather than yes? in terms of whether or not we had a shared vision and an idea of what that success looked look like and how we would get there? Well, I think certainly from our perspective in terms of the bill and the progress that we're making towards implementing, implementing a number of the key um, policies and, and legis 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 legislative kind of requirements to make sure that we can improve the outcomes for children and young people, given that we know that there has been that inconsistency. Lots of local authorities have made progress, for example, on implementing GERFIC. GERFIC has been around for, for a, number of, uh, a number of years, but that inconsistency is persistent. So that's why we need to up the pace of change and why we need to make sure that there is that consistency so that we can have that shared understanding of what the needs of a child is and making sure that we can get it, get it right. Also making sure that we have the kind of tools to empower practitioners, for example, through the Common Core and other things in which we can make sure there's a shared understanding of what a child needs and what the best interventions to make uh, could be. But I think there is, you know, there is a degree of, of progress there. The legislation, I think, will help. OK, thank you. Um, moving on to questions from the committee, we're going to begin with a question from uh, Joan McAlpine. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, in your opening statement, Minister, you talked about the, the rising number of young children who were being looked after. But of course, the, the term looked after would include a large number of children who were supervised at home by their birth parents. And that's one of the areas where this inquiry and the previous inquiry found quite a lot of um, difficulties in, um, in, in terms of those children's uh, those children's outcomes. What guidance do you plan for children who are supervised at home? Um, what's the purpose of supervision at home, first of all? I thank you, and it's a, it's a question, and it's a, it's a good question as well about the looked after at home, because it's an area of of, um, of policy that I think has needed a, a bit more attention. Uh, so we're pleased over the last couple of uh, last few months to have held and hosted two summits to specifically look at. Uh, looked after uh, at home and I was pleased that you were able to, to join us uh, for the, the most recent one um, where we were able to set out a number of the actions and um, outline a number of our thoughts about where we want to go with this and how we want to um, take on board the views that were given to us in the first summit by practitioners, experts in the field to make sure that we can move this agenda forward. So uh, there are a number of uh, action points from, from that, uh, not least uh, making sure that we can uh, make sure that children who are looked after at home have a better uh, degree of support once that is a decision that's been made for them, uh, to make sure that those that is, that is not, they're not cut adrift, that make sure that once they are looked after at home that we can provide uh, proper support. Uh, one of the other uh, action points has been about making sure that we can have a national mentoring scheme, which I think um, 
is something that we should we should welcome. Um, that's been developed by Susan Ellsley, and she gave a presentation at the last summit meeting there, talking about how having a trusted, stable relationship with an adult can be crucial for for a child who's looked looked after, uh, and particularly useful for a child who's looked after at home. So she gave a very compelling case about why that would make a difference for children in Scotland, building on some of the evidence from. Uh, approaches in other parts of the world. So that evidence-based approach, building on what we know that works, the strong relationships with an adult, and uh, making sure that we can make sure that this group of children looked after at home children can be supported to make sure that their outcomes are better than they have been. Do you think, um, certainly the young people who came and gave evidence to us um, in a private session, uh, some of them felt that they had it had taken too long to take them into care and they had been left looked after at home for too long. And a number of those children were quite positive about uh, being in small residential units as, 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 as young teenagers. Um, they found that a more positive experience than being, being left at home. I wondered if you'd care to comment on that and whether there are plans for more of those kind of units. Um, funnily enough, just at the last last couple of weeks, I, I spoke at two events that were organised by Celsius. Um, one about one for residential workers, um, and one for the external managers. And at the one most recently, the external managers that was about us publishing guidance for them to recognise their role in looking after a child in a residential setting. And certainly, the messages that we gave at both those events was about making sure that if that is the right. Um, an appropriate place for a child to go if they need to be looked after, then that should be the first choice for that child and it should be a positive choice for them because absolutely residential workers and residential uh, care settings do uh, provide for that child, if that's appropriate for that child, a good, stable a place for them to hopefully go on and have better and positive outcomes themselves. So yes, absolutely, you have to listen to the child. That work, the residential units work well for children if that's appropriate for them. Uh, but making sure that the residential workers are properly supported has also been a key approach by the government to make sure that they uh, are as aware of the different ways in which they can deal and help and be therapeutic advisors for, for children who are looked after in residential settings. So yeah, absolutely has to be a positive choice and if it's the right choice, it has to be the first choice. And if the, the choice is to leave them at home, what should the outcome be for those children who are left supervised at home? Well, absolutely better than they maybe have been and making sure that they have the support, that there's the family support there, that we can um, make sure that those children do, don't do become lost in the system. So absolutely making sure that they are supported and that that is an appropriate place for them to be, making sure that the, the support is there, which is why you know we were talking at the, the last summit there about how we how we strengthen the support for that child in that if that's the option that's best for them. Because as well, you know, they will have strong attachments to their home setting, their home family as well. And that's why this issue is particularly complicated because there is strong attachments there. It's complicated that there's a lot of possible trauma in that that fam that, that family's life, that child's uh, upbringing. So we need to make sure supports are there in place for them um, and making sure that, for instance, that um, approach or that Susan Ellsley is developing around a, a mentoring scheme, making sure that some of those things can help make sure that that child can have a, a good and positive and happy life. In terms of that network of support, you mentioned the, the increasing role of universal services in your opening statement. What plans does the government have to require all the people who interact with a child across those universal services to have adequate training, both in the importance of attachment and perhaps in uh, child development uh, milestones, so that they can identify when something's gone wrong in a child's life? Um, yeah, and that's, you know, attachments is a key issue there. And I think the more and more that we learn about uh, the development of a child and the early development of a child and the attachments that are formed in the early years of a child's life, that's why we need to make sure that everything that we do do is uh, done as early as it can be to make sure that those... Um, that those crucial years of a child's life can be as nourishing and as nurturing as they possibly can be to make sure that they have the firm foundations in which they can build on and achieve uh, later on in, in their adult life. So we do have uh, the Common Core, making sure that people understand that the developmental needs of a child. Celsus have done work on, on attachment uh, and there have been a whole host of other uh, areas of intervention where we can make sure that practitioners know the value of a child's development, making sure that that is uh, taken cognizance of when they are intervening, making sure that those interventions are proportionate, timely and uh, appropriate. Um, 
and there's a whole load of other uh, work that has been going on, not least it's been um, furnished by um, the academic knowledge of people like uh, Bruce Perry, who came over and spoke at a Caselsis conference talking about the, the, the physical brain development of children and young people. Susan Ziedijk, who's an academic in Dundee, who's been evangelising about the, the need to er for, of early intervention because of the, the, the brain development of, of young children um, as well. So these things help us focus our, our attention to making sure that those interventions that we make are the most, uh, the most appropriate ones for that child and making sure that their life can be as fulfilling as it possibly can be. Thanks very much. Thank you. Neil Finlay. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. <coughs> A number of young people who we, we spoke to had been uh, involved in the system um, advised us they, they were left at home for too long uh, and should have been removed earlier. Um, and we can look at that in two ways, um, but you can look at that as a preventative action that, that moves in early and removes them from the family home and prevents further um, problems down the line. Um, and that can be good for that young person, but for others, um, remaining at home with looked after status can be also seen as preventative as well, obviously for the family. Um, and you know, within the, the responses that we've had for today's session from the government, it, there seems to be quite a, uh, there, doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any urgency in dealing with this because everybody is telling us that that stage of looked after, being looked after at home is a major opportunity for preventative work to be done, for therapeutic work to be done, for work with the family to be done, and we appear to be missing that great opportunity. Um, is it the government's view that there, there needs to be more urgency in us um, uh, putting in support at that time? Well, yeah, like, like I say, you know, um, we need to make sure that the best interest of that particular child uh, is what governs and what directs how that intervention is managed. So. Um, if a home setting and looking, looking after that child at home is the best for that child, then there has to be the supports in place to make sure that that... Well, that's the problem. But, but, well, absolutely. So that's why we need to make sure that given what we heard at the last summit that we held um, over the last six months about making sure that we can take the action points from that to make sure and taking recognition of what, what you've heard here in the committee, making sure that we can drive forward the improvements for that particular tranche of looked after children. Because, yeah, it's absolutely an opportunity becoming looked after should be an opportunity to turn that child's life around and making sure that that child can go on and have a, a, a positive outcome in, in later life. But, you know, as I said to Joan McAlpine at the, at the uh, last summit that we held, we want to make sure that uh, research is much more rigorous to make sure that interventions are uh, based on evidence and they're properly supportive of that family. Uh, to make sure that um, panel members, given the legislative changes that have kind of recently happened for panel, the Children's Hearing Service, making sure that those panel members absolutely know what is expected of a home supervision order to make sure that the support is in place for that child. But likewise, you know, there needs to be an empowering of the, the social work services as well to make sure that they can act at an appropriate time to make sure that if the child needs to be removed from that home setting, that that is, that is done in as, as quickly and as speedily as, as is possible. One of the things that we hear about um, social workers working with, with families is that they have less time to do the work that they're trained for, and that one-to-one uh, -one work, that um, you know, uh, uh, therapeutic work that, that that they want to do, that they're trained to do, but they've got less time to do it. And there's less of them doing it. Um, do you agree that we need to, you know, really take a step back and start to get social workers doing the jobs that they're trained to do? Um, I, I think social workers do a phenomenal job, you know, and sometimes we often hear about things when, when they've gone when they've gone wrong. But there are a number of different players involved with a child's life as well, and not least, you know, I mentioned in opening remarks about the importance of the third sector as well and being able to be fleet of foot and helping to a, a child and young person to, to, to cope. Um, I think absolutely, though, we need to respect social workers and make sure they do feel empowered to make the decisions as time, timeously as, as they can for that child uh, when, if that child has to be has to be looked after and making sure that they feel that they are empowered and that there's not any kind of unnecessary delay within the system so you know some of the exercises and work that we're doing is about making sure that we can declutter the landscape another issue I think I, uh, the, the, the committee picked up upon uh, to ensure that the practitioners who are involved in that child's life can uh, do the job that they want to do and that they've been trained to do. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. 
Minister, given the fact that we've got uh, a huge amount of uh, evidence that's been built up over a period and opinion from experts, we should now know what's best in seeking to return a child to the family home. And if that's so, why are outcomes for these children so poor? Well, no, like I said, at the, at the, to, to Joe McAlpin and to uh, Neil, Neil Finlay, I think you know the last two summits that we held was an opportunity to shine a spotlight on this particular group of children who are looked after, recognising that maybe things haven't always been in place in the way that we would hope or expect. So that's why we need to make sure that if a home supervision is the right choice for that child, that there is proper support in place. Um, you know, through the, the work of the Early Years Task Force, for instance, we understand that interventions like Triple P, Incredible Years, all those kind of interventions that are about strengthening the assets of that family to making sure that maybe they can cope a wee bit better uh, themselves, building on the strengths that they have, because undoubtedly they will have had strengths if that was deemed to be the right approach for that child, that they can be empowered to make sure that they can uh, create a much more nurturing home for that child. But, you know, that is something that we need to work a bit harder at because absolutely we recognise that the outcomes for that particular group of uh, young children who are looked after hasn't been as good as it has been for others. In recent weeks we've actually been uh, talking to some of the young people and it was quite interesting some of the things they were talking about and one thing which they emphasised which none of the professionals and experts had come up with was the importance of a loving relationship. And uh, you know the, the young people thought that this might be messy and all, you know all sorts of things, but they felt that this was a very important thing that was missing in their lives. Now, it's very difficult from a corporate point of view, if you like, to replace that. But how would you envisage that being tackled? And I think you know some of these simple things are often the things that are kind of the, the, the most kind of obvious and the most kind of important uh, to address. And absolutely, a strong, stable relationship is critical for young people to go on and, and achieve um, in the same way that children who aren't looked after have that strong, stable uh, family behind them to help them achieve all that they want to achieve. So I mentioned the national mentoring scheme that has been developed. Uh, Susan Ellsley sits within the Looked After Children Strategic Implementation Group, LACSIG, and she's developing this national mentoring scheme to try and um, make sure that there is an opportunity for children who are looked after at home to have that strong relationship. One of the um, the things that we have taken forward, which is maybe you know loosely related to the work that you're doing, is through the Early Years Collaborative, um, and that's about applying improvement science to Early Years policy. But the looked after uh, the learning session uh, one uh, meeting that we held at the start of the year, Paul Brannigan, who was the actor from the Angel Share, spoke um, about his experience and the stable relationship that he formed was with his prison officer and it was that kind of stable relationship that he had with someone who was able to watch what he was doing to direct and guide him was what allowed him to turn his life around. Now we would hope that you would be getting to that stable relationship before a child or a young person had to end up in prison but certainly it was a compelling story about how important it is having someone who's there to have uh, form that loving relationship with you that allows children to turn their life around and I think as well when we're talking about early intervention um, that it doesn't necessarily always equate with early years that we have to recognise there are points in time in a child's life that you can turn that child's life around and that's why uh, becoming looked after should be absolutely viewed as an opportunity to do so. Another important point which uh, the young people raised was the question of the importance of the continuity of care and uh, I know this is uh, something that's perhaps being addressed in the new bill but uh, they were very anxious about the fact that uh, there came a point where the care just vanished. One minute they're being supported, they hit an age and that's it, it goes. And an interesting point they raised was that whether it would be possible for residential units to have, if you like, open beds so they can go back there for support as and when they need it. And I'm just wondering how practical that might be. I think, you know, if you think about your own family, um, you know, you're you go back and forward to, to your to your mum and your dad, um, you know, beyond the age of what, 18, 16, you know, when a, a child can, can leave care. So, and I think that's the type of support we want to see in place, something that's a bit more reflective of what it's like for um, a family. So we're increasing the age to uh, 25 for a, a young looked after person who, seek, who wants to seek additional help. 
provided that's not support uh, that's not provided by someone else that they can uh, access support if that can be provided by the local authority so I think what's important is making sure that that young person can keep a degree of continuity with a care worker that's, that they may have met in a, in a residential unit. So absolutely, we need to be mindful of what is more reflective of um, family life and trying to do our very best to try and replicate that as best we can. It's difficult because it is, you know, like you recognise, it's a corporate parenting role we have, but we have to try and um, do what we can to make sure that that young person feels uh, supported and not cut adrift as some of the young people have described uh, to you in your committee's uh, evidence session. Ian MacArthur. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Just to, going back to Colin Beattie's earlier point about the, the loving relationship, I mean, I, I think um, I'm right in saying that you referred on a couple of occasions to the importance of creating a strong and stable relationship, and I think that's, that, that's fairly made. But consistently we've been told by the young people that appeared before us in private session and, and at, at yesterday, at last week's event about the importance of a loving and trusting relationship. And I think there's probably an important difference between loving and trusting and strong and, and, and stable. I just wonder, and I know it creating or, or, or yeah, underscoring loving relationships in leg legislation is, is not something I don't think any of us would, we would wish to see, but there does seem to be an important distinction between what younger people, I mean, albeit maybe slightly older than the, the earlier intervention we're talking about, but that what they're looking for is, is, is a loving and trusting relationship, perhaps more than a strong and stable one, which sounds very worthy, but maybe lacks some of the, the, the warmth that um, children kind of need. Mm. And um, yeah, I, no, I guess, and it's not to, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally, totally agree, and that they will be wanting to, to find uh, that, that that loving relationship uh, as well. And you know, I go back to some of the work that has been done as well by the earlier task force, a subgroup on that, and about talking about relationships and the importance of relationships, which is why the government supports Relationship uh, Scotland, uh, Scottish Marriage Care, as well, to make recognising that all of those. Uh, all families maybe from time to time require a bit of help and assistance to make sure that that loving relationships, regardless of whether that's between a couple or with a, uh, with a family, are there and support can be can be given to them. Um, and uh, you know, the work of the, the, the task force is, is very much um, recognising the need for that loving relationship as well. So, um, yeah. It's I mean, is there maybe a distinction that strong and stable as I say, sounds worthy, but it's almost something that's done to them and for their benefit, as opposed to loving and trusting, which is more of a kind of two-way process where actually their views are taken on board and we're kept in, in, informed, etc., of, of what's happening to I them. I guess, I guess, maybe, maybe some of it may be semantics, I guess. You know, some of it, I, I don't think I disagree with what, with what you're saying, and so absolutely that's what the, the mentoring scheme is designed to do, to make sure that there is a, a relationship of, of some sort with a, a trusted adult um, to make sure that that young person can get the support that they deserve and that they need and has been lacking in their lives as well. Um, Recognising as well that there will be still strong attachments to the family as well and there will be a lot of conflict going on for that, that young person as well. So it will require a, a very, very special, dedicated person to provide that. Uh, but I think what we're talking about is largely the same thing, that we recognise that these children who have lacked some of those um, key elements of what a, a strong relationship, a loving relationship will be, and trying to provide it through what we hope will be a, a good uh, project through the National Mentoring Scheme. Neil Finlay. Yeah, in the, the Scottish Government's response to the questions or the points that were put forward, it says that 73% um, of young care leavers had a pathway plan in 2012. Throughout our year of um, taking evidence, all and, and all of the people we have spoken to throughout uh, this period, the only time I've um, heard or saw the term pathway plan is in that response. Is that not concerning? I'm not, you know, it's none of the professionals, none of the young people, none of the third sector organisations have mentioned this, and yet, so is, is that not worrying? I'm not. What did they? Did, did you ask them? About that specifically, well, I'm just trying to work out what I would have they, was that it when, something that wasn't. When we were talking about people leaving care or, uh -huh. or 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 the process through the through the care system, that someone would have said, "Oh yes, each child has a each young person has a pathway plan," or each um, uh, professional who works with them would refer to that. It's just a term that no one has mentioned. I find that quite startling. 
but 73% of them do have it. So there's clearly been a... <laughs> yeah, clearly, though, there have been... That's been developed and it's there for them uh, and it's increasing and that's something we need to make sure happens more regularly. But, you know, again, we go back to the, the fact that the bill will helpfully uh, legislate for and putting Gar Garfec on statute and making so what sure is it? that... Could you, t could you tell us what a pathway plan is? Well, it? making sure that, that there is a clear kind of pathway for that child if they're leaving care to make sure that the supports are in place. But, you know, if people, if practitioners are saying that they're not aware of this, then, you know, we'll take that on board and have, and make sure that that's something Sorry, that's Sorry, just so I'm more misleading you. Pr practitioners have not told us they're not aware of it. It's just no one has mentioned it. Through the whole process, not a person has mentioned the term pathway plan. Now, if they had, then we would have asked, I'm sure someone in the committee would have asked, could you tell us what's in that? Does it, you know, I, I, have, no, I have no idea what's in it. So maybe, maybe if you could tell us what, what would be in someone's pathway plan. Well, I think there's maybe two issues there as well. And I think if, if that's something that the committee has found, which again, you know, is useful because we want to, all of us want to get it right for, for the, the young people who are looked after and accommodated to make sure that they do have a seamless transition into independence. And it's something that absolutely we need to get, get better at. And, you know, that's it's a key challenge there because, you know, they need to have support to go into adulthood and making sure that that is a positive experience for them. And if that's not been clear for the young person, if the young person feels that they've not been included in that, if the practitioners aren't raising that as an issue with you, then that's something we can absolutely take back and make sure that there is more clarity for that. Um, would be in it then, just so to... Well, there would be support in terms of how to... Support in terms of accommodation support, support in terms of looking for um, the destinations through training, education, that type of thing. Perhaps, David, would you like to, to comment? Sure. Well? Um, the the Look After Children guidance um, explains what uh, some of the key elements that should be in the plan. I don't have that guidance with me, but I can certainly send that on um, or, or a version of it to the committee. But there's no prescribed format. It should just be a record, a fairly straightforward record of um, the decisions taken about the aftercare package for a uh, looked after child um, and the support that's needed for that that child. So. Um, uh, so there's no prescribed format, that's what I'm saying. So what standing does that have then? Because a number of the young people were saying that when they left their care setting, that was it. So somebody might have had something written down in some kind of format, but for a number of the young people we spoke to, it meant nothing. It, nothing then happened. I think that's something though, that we've, we've all identified as well, that there is a need to be better at the... the the transition from care to their own independence and making sure that there is support there. And I think that goes back to the point that others have raised about making sure that the, if that young person needs help after they've been in care, that there is a degree of more continuity there, about making sure that they can access the support that they need, which is why the, the bill is looking to increase the age by which a young person who has been looked after can seek that assistance is increased to 25, because that's far more reflective of uh, family life for people, uh, other people who are not in a care setting, albeit you know, within its kind of limitations of what that can mean. Um, Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Convina. Minister, you've you've mentioned a lot in your opening statement and evidence so far about um, family intervention, and I appreciate that there's well, there's a lot of work being done. It's, it's a movable feast that we have here. We we can't really take a snapshot in time about where we are with this. But one of the concerns that did come through from the evidence was um, the decision-making process about returning a child who's been removed from the home back to home and whether the, the adequate interventions have been done, um, whether the problems at home were to do with addiction or, or, or other problems. So ca can you give us some reassurance as to how family intervention will change that sort of situation with a child being removed and returned to a family home repeatedly without actually anything changing within that, that context. Um, and, you know, I think the, the point that you raise is, um, has been expressed not only in the evidence that you've got, but certainly as well in the, the summit that we held, um, the two summits that we held. So we'll be carrying out work over the coming months to assess the support required for children uh, returning home. Um, and that will be informed by the SCRA research as well on children on supervision requirements over uh, five years. 
uh, but certainly within the bill as well, you know, there's the within the kinship care order, there's uh, access. We want to make provision for access to, to family counselling as well, to make sure that there is a far more kind of far more emphasis on therapeutic interventions that can ensure that that family is empowered and um, to enable them to better equip themselves to look after the child to make sure that it is a a far more positive experience for both them and for for the child recognising you know for some kinship carers that they have it's maybe been a, a whole generation since they've last looked after a child so yes there has to be a proper a, appropriate and timely interventions uh, for those children who are being looked after at home uh, but also in terms of family interventions that were taken before children become looked after you know there's a rule out of family nurse partnership working with um, teenage uh, parents to make sure that they can uh, be better equipped to look after their babies. Um, that evidence has shown that they have then spaced them out, spaced out their babies a wee bit. Um, there's a bit more time between their next child that they're far more able to look after their next child because of the parenting skills that they have uh, been equipped with through this intensive support. Uh, the family nurse, uh, the sorry, the earlier task force is also advocating um, uh, the triple P incredible years as other forms of intervention as well in a, in a group setting. Uh, the parenting strategy that we launched last year as well also articulates the importance of parenting as well and the fact that every parent, regardless of whether a child is looked after or not, may require a degree of support and help. So I think there's a number of things going on to make sure that there is support in place and to recognise that support is often needed, regardless of the level of support, to hopefully make sure that every child um, is given that a uh, good start in life. Neil Finlay. Um, on the resources available, um, can I ask how much uh, we spend on protecting children? Um, protecting children, I don't know. Phil, do you have any do you protecting, have children. protecting children. In terms of child protection? On protecting children, uh, in terms of the whole budget heading of protecting children? I, talking yeah. about within the national government, across Scotland as a whole, local government? Scotland. I'm not sure the statistics are collected that way. I mean, there's there's something about what you mean by protecting children, because clearly you could argue that a lot of social work, a lot of children's services, more generally, all that expenditure is there for protecting children. So, uh, so we don't know how much. I think we'd have to come back to you. Then. No, I think we've asked for that twice already, and have you? yeah, we've asked for that for twice already, and we've not had the figure. Um, and clearly, there's an issue there because if we. Um, uh, if we're going to plan services and if we're going to determine whether public money has been well spent or poorly spent, then we need to know initially how much is being spent. Yes. Oh, I see. I think, yeah, and I understand the, 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 yeah, the question now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we came back to you to say that, you know, absolutely we need to have far more... Uh, a far greater understanding of what has been spent and how we spend it to make sure that we can strategically plan for what we're doing going forward. Um, but as Philip says, you know, there is a kind of complicated landscape there with terms of all the interactions of different agencies and the different, you know, third sector organisations, health sector, all these different things that come together to make sure that we can ensure adequate protection for children is in place. Um, but you know, again, we'll look back and if we can provide you with any more figures, we will do so. But I think in the original answer that we gave you, it, it, it recognised that there was a, a need to do a bit more uh, work on that. The whole budget's complex, but we can put a figure on it. So surely we can put a figure on this because we, we have to know whether uh, the amount of money we spend has been yeah. spent well or spent badly. Uh -huh. It's true, but it can be difficult to define because a lot of services will be set up to do a whole range of things. Mm -hmm. Important part of which is actually protecting children. Mm -hmm. So there's an argument in which almost all of children's services is there to protect children one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Much of the education budget is there to protect children. So getting into this is, is, is quite a complex thing because part of the, the, the purpose of protecting children, the way it's actually rooted in GERFECT across many agencies, is that Universal Services has this as part of their um, their, their ongoing functions. It's hardwired into what they do as a whole. And therefore, extracting the protecting children bit is maybe, there, there's a difficulty in it because it's almost separating out something from what they should be doing as part of their everyday business. But so, I mean, if you're advocating that we ring fence to give you that clarity that you want, then, you know, if that's something that the committee wants to recommend, you know, it's time to go back to Cotisla <laughs> no, no. <laughs> with that. You, know, you mentioned that, I didn't. Uh, yeah. You know, all I asked is what, what the money is that we're spending on, on this element of the budget, because there's clearly 
very significant issues have been raised during this inquiry, that would normally then lead to government taking a response that either requires more cash or less cash. But if we don't know whether it's more cash or less cash than some figure that we don't know, how can we establish whether we need to invest or take money back? Um, if you don't know your starting point. We've also though, been doing work as well about making sure that the, with the money and the resource that is being spent, that that can be spent in a much more strategic way. So the, um, the help and assistance that's been going on with local authorities around strategic commissioning about making sure that we can uh, properly and much uh, more effectively prepare uh, the services that are required for children to make sure that they are more um, alert to the needs of a child to make sure, sure it's not just a kind of, oh, what's out there will place a child with this particular care setting, to make sure that that whole commissioning is a bit more streamlined. <coughs> that's another way to make sure that we can effectively use the money that's uh, within the system to, to do that. But again, you know, like, there is the complications of all the different services coming together. I think, you know, there is, in terms of what can be possibly spent on children's services, it's into the it's like two, two and a half billion, and I think within the early years, um, task force, the £270 million change fund, albeit small, is about making sure that that money, the global total of resources that have been brought to that table, can be put in, in towards early intervention and effective intervention. Um, but it's easy to say early intervention, and, but it's, you know, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a cultural change that needs to happen for services in order to make sure that we can uh, determine the, better, the best outcomes for children and young people. In this area, what does strategic commissioning mean? about where the best place for a child can be put, you know, making sure that the resources are spent in areas of need for a particular local authority, but making sure the, the best place uh, is available for that child and that there is a planned um, and proportionate intervention for that child to make sure that it's not just a, about where is free, but actually about placing a child with permanence planning in the background to make sure that there, there are, there's a limit to how many places a child may have, making sure that it's done in, a, in a, the best way it possibly can be for that child. Can I just follow up on that, Minister? Um, uh, the issue of resources has come up um, during the inquiry in a, in a number of different ways. I mean, I accept it's very complicated and complex to extract the, 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 an exact figure. Um, but do you think that resources that are allocated to this area are being spent appropriately and efficiently? Well, you know, the whole hallmark of the approach of government and what we're trying to do across the whole of the public sector is about making sure we can shift the resources to early intervention. But as I said to, to, to Neil Finlay, that's a cultural change that we need to try and, and bring about. So um, I think everyone recognises that there is there are kind of pressures on finances, so we need to use the money that we have within the system to the best uh, of our ability. So that means early intervention, that means preventative spending, that means making sure that we can get the most from the, 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 the finances that we have within the system to ensure that we have the best outcomes we possibly can. Um, you know, one example is the Early Years Change Fund, um, making sure that we can uh, try and bring about some of that cultural shift. The other example would be through the earlier's collaborative about the way in which on a small kind of in small scales in a small in a small way that local authorities with their partners in the third sector health sector and others are making sure that the interventions they make uh, do produce the outcomes they want and scaling that up uh, and that's about making sure that that's where you spend your money is about making sure that you can support that change to ensure the best outcomes and making sure you've got reliable, robust, real-time data uh, to ensure that you can act with confidence. And that's why we're you know, very much wanting to promote an evidence-based approach. This is why we're using Family Nurse Partnership, Triple P, incredible years. They've got the evidence base behind us to make sure that we can inform the direction uh, of that policy can take. Is it, I'm glad you've raised that issue, but is it possible to quantify um, whether or not we are actually being successful in shifting resources to early intervention, and is it then possible to quantify what impact that shift in resources has achieved? Uh, well, the, from the earlier task force, there have been um, you know, a number of 
number of changes that have been made to ensure that preventative spending is the is the kind of the watchword there. But we have also requested that councils give us returns on how that uh, is coping. So those are those are coming in to make sure and that's a year that the task force has been in place. So it's about making sure that we yeah we do know that their partnership has been uh, effective at a local setting through the community planning partnerships and making sure that we can get informa information back about how they have approached um, preventative spending and early intervention. I, I accept it's early days, then, but when, when will we be able to see that kind of data? When will we be able to know whether that, 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 that has occurred? Yeah, well, we've put out a request um, months ago I think a couple of months ago to seek the returns from the local authorities and when we get that back once the task force has has looked at that we can maybe share that with you okay um thank you for that um Liam McArthur thank you convener I mean, just taking you back minister to um a, a, an issue that Claire was raising earlier in relation to the, the problems of achieving permanency and the multiplicity of, of moves um one of the consistent themes you've heard throughout this inquiry uh, from young people is, uh, I believe on their part, particularly uh, as they get older, that through those difficult changes, their voice um, isn't heard clearly enough, that um, the level of information and, and the timeliness of that information uh, has not been good enough. Um, uh, very often, uh, young people almost blame themselves when they're first taken into care. Um, and that not enough is done to um, reassure them about that, but also gives them uh, perhaps advance warning of what is coming up and um, the reasons for it, etc. Um, and I suppose it goes back to the earlier point I was making about um, trust and, and the trusting relationship that, that, that young people have um, with a range of individuals involved in the, in the process. Uh, can you maybe share with the committee um, your thoughts on how the voice of children can be better heard uh, through the system and, and how young people, particularly um, those as they get older, uh, are included and involved in the, in the process that, um, that, that is, at the end of the day, supposed to be about securing their best interests. Um, yeah, I, and I agree absolutely that the young, the young person's voice has to be heard absolutely and that's the, you know, that's part of the, the GIRFEC approach, making sure children are at the heart of the services that are de delivered and designed around them, making sure that they have a, a voice in that and making sure that the information they get, which I know that had been raised, I think, with you, had, is, um, is honest and upfront and making sure that they are fully informed about what's going on to them because they have these, they've had traumatic experiences, they've had um, relationship breakdowns with the families or whatever, you know, they've gone through an awful lot in their young lives, so they absolutely have to be treated with the respect that they deserve and making sure that the information they get is is is, is trustworthy. Um, I think the work that Who Cares Who We Support has done has been uh, phenomenal, uh, making sure that the corporate parents around the country understand their role, uh, making sure that the training that they uh, get is uh, mindful of the young person always at the, when they're making these decisions. And I think their destigmatisation campaign um, is part of, part of that work, making sure that people understand that it's not the young person's fault that they're in care, it's absolutely nothing to do with them. They have the right now to be cared for and nurtured by uh, the corporate parent and I think the work that they're doing uh, in advocating for uh, young looked after people around the country is, is to be applauded and I, I'm sure it has enriched your um, your evidence sessions that you've had. Um, we also want to make sure that panel training uh, is, is more ref more kind of robust and I think with the new channel children's hearing system coming uh, going live that there's opportunities now to make sure that there's a national consistency to that approach uh, as well. So there are a number of ways in which we can make sure that children's voices are heard, not least as well making sure that we have good relationships with um, Who Cares and other organisations to make sure at a national level we can hear uh, young people's voices and make sure that the policies that we take forward are reflective of and mindful of their views. The legislation that we're bringing forward, which will embed uh, GERFEC and will also um, have a much more uh, cognizance of the UNCRC, which uh, very much is about um, making sure voices, children's voices are heard will also help uh, make sure that not just government but the wider public sector uh, is mindful of their role in ensuring young people have a voice in the processes that are going on around them. I mean, obviously the priority <coughs> 
was more about trying to reduce the number of, of, of moves in placement than achieving that permanency uh, earlier. Also, I think a factor would be perhaps limiting um, the uh, the number of different, whether it be social workers or, or other participants in the process that, that the child has to deal with. But that, from what you're saying, there would be an expectation that that information would be shared with the child uh, in advance, uh, save for those instances where there may be a risk of, of, of the child perhaps uh, absconding in order to avoid a move. Your, your expectation would be that that information should be shared uh, ahead of time unless there are good and compelling reasons not to. Yeah, my expectation would be that the young people are very much part of the part of the process, that they are very much at the heart of the um, the process of arranging and supporting that child if they are coming into care and you know I, I think if that's not been happening and that's causing that young person uh, trauma then that's absolutely something that should be should be avoided and making sure that they feel as informed as they can be and then making sure that that information they get is provides to them in, a, in an appropriate way and is truthful and honest uh, because the last thing that that young person needs is to feel that another relationship that they've had with an adult hasn't been uh, as trustworthy, as honest as it, as it could be, to making sure that they can uh, feel that they are respected in the, the, the process of them going to care or being looked after. I mean, I think we had, I think from all of them, instances where it, it had worked well, but they then used that as a contrast to where it, it hadn't been and, and that... Yeah, myself, you know, you hear, you hear a group of young people, whether it's through Who Cares or through the debate project or through other... Uh, the other uh, groups that are supporting young looked after people and you realise that depending on where they've come from, their stories are very different. So yeah, there has to be a degree of consistency for, for uh, young looked after uh, people, recognising that each and every one of them has an individual circumstance. So it can't be like a kind of blanket approach, but it has to re be reflective of their individual needs. Uh, but making sure that their voices are heard, that that information they get is provided in a trustworthy and honest way and making sure that they don't feel like they're in the dark and that they don't feel like they're having to experience more trauma in their lives because of, on, to compound the, the, the experiences they've had already in their in their young lives. So we have to make sure that we, we get things right for them because there's no point in, uh, in doing anything other. Another, uh, another concern uh, was around the, the actual overall number of people in, involved in the process, not uh, including the hearings process, but, but in the other uh, sort of fora that are, 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 uh, are attached to the, 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 the kind of process. Is that something that either through the legislation or, or the direction of travel of policy is likely uh, to change? Because certainly the view was it had uh, uh, an effect on, uh, I suppose, the, uh, the confidence that some young people had um, to, to speak out and, and, and articulate their views. And, well, the name person within um, the, the, the legislation should go some way towards um, streamlining some of that. I guess an unfortunate kind of reality of it that there will be lots of people involved, but it has to be done in a, in a more kind of a sensitive way if that has been causing uh, stress and trauma to that child. So I believe that the, the name person's role within the legislation will go some way towards having a, a single point of contact which can... Uh, Help that young person navigate themselves through the through the, the the care process. That would that would allow if if it were appropriate for fewer people to be in, involved, albeit their input would perhaps still need to be captured in, in, in some way. I would hope so. I think you know that's designed. You know the, the name person's designed to uh, make sure there's a single point of of contact, uh, a single port of call, uh, designed and provided within universal services to make sure that there is. Um, a more streamlined approach to, to providing those services, uh, but you know I go back. You know there is probably going to be a, a number of different people involved in that young person's life, but it just needs to be managed in a sensitive way to ensure that that's not causing them undue uh, stress or trauma on top of everything else that they've had to experience. Just one, one final point. I, obviously, the the extension um, to 25 of the the, the um, uh, time scale where support can be provided where it's appropriate is, is welcome. But I think one of the points that was made was that. Um, while we may leave the family home, uh, we never leave the family. And, and in a sense, um, it, it should the concept of leaving care um, exist at all? And whether or not that is a, a, a practical option, uh, I, I'm not sure. But there was there's certainly a view, and I think Bernardo's have been um, particularly strong on this, that um, capturing what happens 
to individuals after they leave the care system isn't done as systematically um, uh, or comprehensively as it, as it should be. Is that something that um, government is looking to try and uh, improve, either, again, through the legislation or through other means? Um, well, yeah, moving the, the age up to 25 is designed to be more reflective of what other people's lives are like uh, and making sure that um, there is that support in place and recognising that the corporate parents' role does stretch to the age of 25 and if they can if, if they're in a position to help that young person then they then they should do so um, I think there is a bit of work to be done on terms of <coughs> monitoring the the data beyond uh, the care setting and that's work that we are alert to and alive to and want to to make sure is uh, uh, carried out um, and I think the mentoring scheme would also provide some uh, help and assistance as well in terms of young people who are who are leaving care, there will be a connection or a, a solid relationship that they'll form there. Um, I also think, as well, given what we've heard from the residential workers at the last couple of conferences that I've been to as well, that residential workers are very important in some young people's lives as well and about providing that, that support beyond the, that care setting, that they're very much uh, someone who has helped turn young people's lives around and they're very important and we should recognise the fantastic work that residential workers do across Scotland in, in providing that support to, to young people. Don McAlpine. Yes, just a quick supplementary, uh, Minister, on that point. At uh, our um, meeting last week with professionals, some representatives of residential workers said that they felt that continuing a relationship with a child after that child had left care uh, would put a mark of suspicion on them um, and uh, they, they, they felt that they could even be disciplined for example being a Facebook friend of the child and I just wondered what you know what guidelines were available to protect them in order for them to continue to be to maintain relationships with children I think it's more about making sure that it's not just a kind of a, a cliff edge that young people kind of face when they leave care and making sure that that, that there's an openness there to be able to you know, if there is a need to kind of come back and, and, and seek advice and guidance that, that that residential worker is there to do so. But, you know, absolutely kind of being mindful of of if there is a fear from residential workers in, in doing something which is probably quite, um, you know, naturally instinctive, that if that's something that they feel is, is stopping them, do that, then we should, we should help them. And certainly there's a, a number of bits of guidance that are out there for residential care workers. Uh, they're now a registered workforce as well, so there are, there are um, procedures and structures in place to help with them. Neil Bibby. Thanks, thanks Kavina. Uh, Minister, you mentioned earlier the number of uh, looked after children were increasing. Um, given estimate numbers of uh, children who suffer neglect vary from research to research, study to study, do you have any plans to begin recording the numbers um, as you do for children on uh, child protection registers and also children with additional support needs? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, making sure that um, children who you know, neglect is one of, you know, it's a big, it's a big issue that we need to, to tackle and making sure that we can um, properly deal with that is, is absolutely fundamental. And just last week we uh, launched training materials uh, specifically for neglect. It was Bridget Daniels who has developed and designed that. So uh, those are available on the With Scotland uh, website, I think. And um, so that's one example of where we're trying to make sure that we can uh, better uh, deal with issues around neglect and being alert uh, and empowering practitioners to be more alert to neglect um, as a kind of form of early intervention. I, obviously, neglect is a very important issue that needs to be tackled. Is it your intention to compile kind of data and statistics on the on the level of neglect? Obviously, we have varying different statistics on what the extent of the problem is. Perhaps I could yeah. uh, ask them that. Um, obviously, defining what you mean by neglect and what circumstances is one of the reasons why they're varying different statistics. Um, but we do collect statistics on neglect through the information on the Child Protection Register. You'll know that the statistics that came out in March, which I think was the, the last official publication on statistics on child protection, captures um, what the concerns were that put the kids on the Child Protection Register, and neglect is one of the ones that we collect on. So we've been doing that for a number of years, and we've, uh, I think with this past statistic, uh, statistical publication of 
provide a lot more clarity about the, uh, the nature of the concerns that are there. So, sorry, is that <coughs> children who are on the child protection yep. register who have been neglected. Yes. I guess. I guess the question I'm asking is: is a, we understand there's a whole uh, number of children who aren't on the child protection register but who are suffering neglect, mm -hmm. and that's the, the statistics that I think we um, that we need to try and. Um, have the, a, have the work to help, the outlined the work that we're doing to help empower practitioners to be more alert to the, the issues of, of neglect, and that's um, on with Scotland's website. Okay. Um, um, do you have any, in terms of in terms of um, agencies, um, different agencies working on on issues around children who suffer neglect? Do you have any uh, plans to introduce powers to centralise control under Scottish ministers? and remove power over children's services from local authorities and health boards? With respect to, uh, well, with respect to neglect? To, to neglect? I don't understand. You over want us to take away responsibility from yeah, local do you authorities? Have any, yeah, do you have any plans to remove control mm -hmm. from, over, from local authorities and health boards over children's services to centralise it? Under is, to the, the government? Is there something specific you have in mind? Sorry, I don't, just for clarity. I, have you heard something that we've not heard? <laughs> uh, do you mean taking control of social work, children's services, health visitors, all these things, and having that control in in, in national government? Because that you, that's certainly not a plan of the government. Right. So, you, but in, ten, in, in, ten, in terms of, um, you you will not introduce powers to centralise that that sort of. My understanding is that their legislation exists and. Sorry, maybe maybe speak a bit wide of the mark here, but that where local authorities fail in their duties and functions, ministers already have powers to take uh, steps to act, uh, regardless of whatever those functions and powers are. But we could certainly come back on clarification of that if it's a specific question regarding children's services, the failure of local authorities, and I respect, I guess, health boards, but with regard to acting on their their functions with regard to children, is is that specifically what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Um, what, um, in terms of, uh, we've heard particular concerns about um, children um, who are in the early years and, and, and decision making affecting very young children. Um, what what are the government plan in terms of um, the work through the early years collaborative um, to tackle uh, neglect amongst them? Um, very young children, and also how can we improve the decision making for very young children? Lee MacArthur mentioned earlier about children needing to be heard. Obviously, it's very difficult um, for very young children to often make their views known. What what would your uh, response be to that? In terms of the earlier's collaborative um, that you asked about first, um, the stretch aims are about making sure that children have the best start in life that we can have that we can collect robust data about the interventions that have been made by practitioners to ensure that once they are confident that the interventions that they make are delivering the results that they want, that they can uh, scale that up. And that shared, um, that, can, that, that information will be shared, has been shared over the last two learning sessions um, that people across the country, every single community plan and partnership across Scotland has been working together in partnership to make sure that the interventions they're making are delivering the results that they that they, they, they want. Now, if that doesn't always happen, then that's actually a, a helping with your knowledge as well about maybe, you know, not doing, a, not continuing with a particular intervention if it's not delivering the results that you want. So that real-time data has been collected, has been collected by CPPs around the country. Now, uh, the last learning session, we were being able to the local community planning partnerships were being able to share that that learning uh, amongst themselves to ensure that that can uh, be applied uh, across other uh, local authorities. But you know that won't necessarily be a kind of carbon copy. It'll have to be reflective of a particular local authority's needs and settings and uh, geography. Um, one that might be of interest to the committee is the borders work which is looking at particularly looked after children and, and permanence planning as well around one of their stretch aims that they're trying to improve upon so you know that that gives you one example of where one local authority is looking to seek to improve the law of looked after children and using the tech, the improvement science advanced by earlier's earlier collaborative to enable them to do so 
Uh, one of the one of the major issues affecting um, very young children uh, we've heard is around kind of mental health issues, and I know uh, in its strategy for mental health, the Scottish government made a commitment to improve infant mental health. Um, does the government have plans to invest in uh, the skills of key staff who will deliver uh, the stated improvement, for example, health visitors, nurses, and social workers? Well, the whole uh, emphasis within the Children and Young People Bill is about making sure that we can do our very best for children and young people who need the support that they require. Now, the, that means putting GERFEC on statute, and that requires making sure that requires uh, an understanding of the different interventions, different workforces, and different skill sets can have. So, absolutely, it's about recognising their um, important role in ensuring that we can deliver for children and young people who need and require additional help through their lives. So, health visitors are absolutely a, a fundamental part of ensuring that children and young people can go on to have a happy and fulfilling lives and are very much uh, part of the, the workforce that we want to, to empower and see in, 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 in terms of trying to seek the, the changes, the positive changes that we want. Um, thank you. Um, I know that... Uh, did you have an extra supplementary question? Liz? No, sorry. Um, children's hearings have come up a number of times. I know that Colin Beattie wanted to, to ask a question on that. Colin. Yeah, there's a couple of points came out on uh, children's hearings. Um, the first was from the young people themselves when we had the opportunity to talk to them, and I accept it's a, a rather narrow group that we did talk to, but consistently they were talking about uh, the fact that often they didn't understand what was going on, that people were talking over their heads, and indeed several of them said that they actually lied at children's hearings in order to... Uh, uh, if you like, conform in order not to rock the boat, um, and I think there, I think it would appear from that that there are there are perhaps uh, some difficulties in getting through to the child, getting the child's views heard. The second point that was made by other people giving evidence was in relation to the increasing presence of lawyers at hearings and mostly representing parents and children's hearings. Perhaps are not quite equipped to deal with legal arguments. And uh, where does the child come in on this? Because if it's the parents' rights that are being represented by the lawyers, where does the child come in? Um, in terms of children's hearing, um, I think the new, the, ch new the, the children's hearing system, which has now gone live um, at the start of the week, provides an opportunity to make sure that there are there is far more consistency, making sure that where there's best practice, if that if a child can feel that going through the panel has been a positive experience that, that can be replicated, uh, making sure that training is far more robust and, uh, and empowering of the panel members to make sure that they're doing things as sensitively as they can be. And recognising that the panel members are volunteers and are doing a phenomenal amount of work, a lot of good work as well, to ensure the well-being of children across Scotland. Um, in terms of law, there's been a number of different things that we've been trying to, to, to to work through because there is a recognition of that interface between the legal services and uh, children's services about the need for them to understand exactly concepts like GERFEC and whatever. So officials and uh, fairly senior officials have been uh, working very hard to make sure that there's appropriate links there to try and influence the way in which uh, the legal service can uh, deal and cope with um, cope with the, the decisions that they'll have to make and so that there's no undue delay uh, and making sure as well that the balance is uh, appropriate because you know you, you, you touched upon an issue around children's rights versus parents' rights, and absolutely, if we're going to be true to GERFEC, then children's rights will be um, uh, of uh, paramount concern to people when they're making decisions. So, I believe the the, the, the bill which will enshrine GERFEC uh, on statute will go some way towards making sure that that balance is always uh, appropriate. Talking to the kids again. One of the points that they made was that there didn't seem to be a process whereby they were talked to separately, where they had an opportunity to give their views away from parents and other people that perhaps they felt a little bit influenced by. Um, almost in a personal capacity, I can maybe respond to that regarding children's hearing, because I've recently started as a children's panel member, and I've been struck by some really good, what I would have to call good practice, where often the lead has to come from the chair of a children's panel where they've cleared the room in order to speak to the child on their own, to, in order to 
the child to feel more comfortable. And obviously there's only so far you can do to make a child feel comfortable in that kind of environment. But they've been very, very acutely aware of the fact the child often has an audience and it's important for the child to be able to, to be able to present their views to the panels without those people there. So a lot of it thing comes down to good practice and when I'm hoping, I think, the, the, the launch of the, um, the enactment, the implementation of the new act and Children's Hearing Scotland will enable that kind of good practice, which I've seen in the panels, be spread more widely to enable children to have that kind of, uh, that experience as a more regular occurrence. Liam? Just very briefly, comments in the, uh, the concerns in relation to the, the, um, uh, the input of legal representatives in the hearings process. I, I think the concerns we've also heard is it extends beyond that and actually some of the problems are, are perhaps uh, almost more in relation to the, the court process where you've got legal representatives whose understanding of attachment theory, child development, whatever it is, it is, is perhaps um, not particularly extensive. Um, and yet in that court setting, um, they are seen to hold as much, if not more, sway than some of the other um, experts who are, are, are called to, uh, to give evidence or participate. Is that something that is being addressed possibly through the interaction you've suggested at senior official level? Yes, um, there's much more inter interaction with um, um, the Scottish Court Service, the Scottish Prison Service, uh, the Scottish Legal Aid Board. Um, there's been a lot more dialogue with um, family um, uh, family sheriffs um, to make sure that they understand about permanence and all these different things that, that you've alluded to as well. So um, that's um, what the, the work has been uh, good that's been going on for the last uh, few months about making sure that there is a much more wider knowledge of all the different elements that are important when making decisions about a child. Okay, I, th I think this brings us on to an area of what just started to touch on about the balance of rights between uh, children and parents. So I'll bring in Liz Smith at this point. Uh, Minister, I think, I think one of the greatest complexities that this committee is uh, having to grapple with is this balance between children's rights and the rights of parents, particularly but of other uh, stakeholders. Um, could you just uh, expand on what advice uh, that the government is taking in, on this basis, particularly legal advice? For a, a hearings? No, just, just generally general. about uh -huh. the, the balance between... I mean, obviously this whole thing is about if we are to expand on the rights of children, uh, then we have to be very sure that we're not undermining the rights uh, of others, particularly parents. I'd be very interested to know about the legal advice that the government is seeking on this. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, everything that we do on all the policies that we take are underpinned by GERFET getting it right for every child, making sure the child is at the centre of the decisions that are taken. So that's the thing that's underpinning all the actions that we take. Uh, and of course we have to recognise that parents do have a role as well within uh, decisions. Now, for instance, the last time I was at the committee, we passed a series of SSIs, which were about making sure parents have a, an appropriate role are within the hearing system as well. So um, that's been there to protect them within the, uh, the hearing system too. So um, as for legal advice, do we have... I can get back to you on any particular legal advice. It's, just, it's, it's been pointed out to us quite, quite a number of times that obviously there, if we are to extend the rights of children that we may have uh, some uh, development of that of Scots law within relation to European law. And I'd just be interested to know at what stage you are with taking advice on this. So we can't... We, we don't disclose if we've had legal advice, but uh, certainly in terms of making sure that uh, there is a recognition within the legal world of areas like permanence, GERFEC and others, that, that those relationships have been formed and are continuing to ensure that when we're bringing forward legislation, that everyone involved in the decision making around a child is, a, is aware of the things that they should be taking uh, notice of and making sure that children's rights and parents' rights are given the appropriate balance. I, I fully understand Minister, that you can't give us the details of what the legal advice is, but I think you can confirm uh, as to whether the Scottish Government is looking at uh, other legislation, um, specifically ECHR, uh, as to how compatible it is um, with the development of increasing children's rights. I think you can confirm that for us. I would point out that with the Children and Young People Bill putting forward, clearly one of the key, func the key duties we would have to done was to make sure it's compatible with the ECHR. And uh, as you would have seen from the supporting documentation, um, clearly that's something 
that we, we believe. Could I just press you a little bit further as to whether uh, th there is dis discussion going on as to whether you would like to see Sc Scots law being incorporated in other aspects, something that was put to us in various phases? Other aspects? In, in terms, obviously, that, that if, we, if we look at what the proposals are for the bill and the extension of uh, the rights of the child, then by definition that has implications for, or possible implications for Scots law and how that articulates with European law. Can you tell us at what stage you are in taking advice on that? I'm not sure we've been in a position to say that. Say, uh, but, but if we are able to, we can take advice and guidance about what we can disclose and if appropriate we can come back. Very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, Minister. Uh, one of the things in the breakout groups that we had last week was I was able to chair one that had, ironically, the, um, probably more social workers than anything else, social work professionals. And the question was that the rule of optimism within social work, does it create a reluctance to remove children from the family home? Now, their answer back to us when the discussion started was that they felt there might have been a contradiction between the policy objectives of getting it right for every child and when they're also having to deal with adults in recover recovery, whether it be alcohol and drug addiction. And uh, when you looked at it and you heard their discussion, you actually said there probably is an issue there, you know, the, with the fact they're trying to keep the family together, trying to ensure this person gets on the road to recovery. You know, what would be your own opinions on that? They asked us to ask that question of you. Do you think there's a contradiction there or do you believe that there's a way they can get a balance to, in order to make sure that both objectives are actually achieved? And I think... Um, you know, some of what we've we've touched upon today around making sure that um, appropriate family interventions are there and made that they can, whether that's needed over a longer term or whether it's a kind of short burst of intervention, that as long as what is always at the forefront of the of of the the, the, the people who are making the decisions about the child, as long as their that child's well-being is at the forefront of those decisions, then I think you know that social workers should be empowered and able and enough to make sure that they can make that decision at the right time to make sure that that child, if it needs to be removed from the family, that that's done at the appropriate time, it's done as quickly as it, as it, as it can be, but also if there's an opportunity to empower that family to be able, better able, better to cope with that child, then that should be, a, 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 you know, a, you know, that should be done as well, uh, and that's why you know we're quite keen on the whole parallel planning. Which I think you heard some of the stuff from the New Orleans approach as well about making sure that if you are working with a with a family that you can have in uh, in in process an approach to make sure that if you need to um, remove that child, that that can be done more uh, quickly uh, to ensure that there's not that drift and delay that I think has been. Uh, causing a lot of concern for, for all of us is, uh, with an interest in the outcomes for looked after children. So I think the parallel planning, the, the work that the New Orleans project has been doing, um, the work that the early years collaborative um, work in the borders, all of that's about making sure that you can you can work with the family but if you need to you can step in and make sure that you can move that remove that child from the family in a, an appropriate way. One of the other points that they brought up as well was uh, you know, they asked, uh, they, have, they were wanting to ask yourself, like, is there anything that could be done at a national level to improve practice around contact? Now, it was one of the things that a lot of the young children were saying to us as well, or not so much the young, the young people were saying to us, was where well, that uh, there might have been four in a family, and you might have had a situation where two of them were in the central belt, maybe in the same care home, and uh, two were in Perth or somewhere like that, you know, and uh, there was very, because there was a difference in age, there was difficulty for contact, and that left quite a scar with the uh, mental scar uh, with uh, the, some of the older, particularly the older sibling, in uh, one case I can think of in particular, and uh, they were wondering, uh, they actually, when we discussed this with uh, some of the social work professionals, they wondered if there was a way that we could possibly, because th their answer was that it was difficult for them to deal with it because they dealt with whoever they were dealing with the case in their area. So is there anything we could have done nationally on it? Well, we're funding uh, Celsius to focus on that and to spread uh, good practice uh, about making sure that, 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 and taking on board the issues you're talking about in terms of contact to make sure that that can be done in a, in a bit more of a sympathetic way, recognising the kind of the spread of nature of some children around, around the country. So, yeah, absolutely, we're funding uh, Celsius to do some work on that. Liam's already asked my other question. Was he? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Listen, I, I, I want to ask Minister, if you don't mind, a, a couple of questions that I don't think have been covered or have only been, just been touched on before wrapping up. Um, a rather crude measure of um, success or failure, certainly in the past, has been uh, the number of children that have been taken into care. In other words, uh, if the number of children being taken into care is rising, that's a failure. If it's falling, that's a success. Um, can, can you just clarify exactly the government's view on this particular um, attitude? Uh, and secondly, um, I hope you confirm that um, it's not about the number of children being taken into care, it's the issue, it's the outcome for those children, irrespective of whether they're taken into care or whether they're left at home or whatever, whatever setting they uh, end up in. Where I would form an agreement with you as well is about, you know, it would be too, too crude to judge success on the numbers uh, alone, um, although the numbers I outlined at the, or the, 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 the statistics that I outlined at the start of the session talked about more uh, younger children being taken uh, into care and more um, so I think that shows that there's been decisions taken at an earlier stage. So I think there is a need to be a bit more sophisticated in how you interpret the figures uh, and the LACSIG uh, work. Um, there's a work stream looking at how we collect the data, what we do with the data, whether the data we do collect is actually telling us the right things. So I would agree with you that you know just simply saying up and down in terms of numbers and that equals and equates to success or failure is, is too crude and we have to look beyond that. So too we have to make sure that we have a, a better, rounded, more rounded picture of what a, a looked after child's well-being is like and not just maybe base success on educational attainment alone but making sure that we have a, a much more rounded picture of that young person as well because you know that, that broader uh, approach allows us to, to properly gauge whether there has been success in that child's life through the looked after intervention that they've had. Thank you. We, uh, as you'll be aware, we, we met with uh, young people who'd been through the care system um, um, a couple of months ago. And one of the things I think all of the young people said to us, with the exception of those who'd been taken into care as, as very young children or babies, was that um, it took far too long, uh, many years uh, in most cases, for them to be taken into care. Uh, secondly, they said that uh, I think nearly all of them, if not all of them actually, said that they had been removed from the parental home because of their behaviour. In other words, their, their behaviour had descended to such an extent of, uh, you know, perhaps vandalism, criminal behaviour, violence, uh, other uh, forms of behaviour like that. Uh, they were removed from, from the, went through the cheering system because of that behaviour and were removed from the home because of that behaviour rather than because they were under uh, abuse and neglect from uh, their uh, parents. Um, and attached to that was that uh, when they were removed, siblings, younger siblings, were left uh, in the same parental home. Um, now, those young people had been through the system. Has the system changed, in your view, that uh, it's no longer the case that uh, children are left for many years in the same way as they described? Um, and secondly, is it the case now that uh, children um, are being removed from the home um, because of the abuse and neglect they suffer rather than because of the bad behaviour that eventually uh, they undertake because of the abuse and neglect? Uh, well, I don't have the figures to hand, but certainly the whole, you know, since the children's hearing system began, the whole kind of, um, the proportions of children and the reasons for them being through the, going through the children's hearing system have completely changed over the 40 years that it's been in existence. So uh, now you're seeing far, far more of them coming through through because of... We're talking to were, we're only in the early 20s, this is relatively recent. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the longer kind of term mm. change in the children's hearing system and that at the start it might have been people were going through the hearing system because of behaviours that they had exhibited, but now far more children, the proportions had completely turned, turned its head and far more are coming through because of um, issues around child protection, neglect, all these different things that we've touched upon today. So the whole... Um, that has changed, so far more are going through because of because of those reasons as opposed to because of um, their 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 behaviours, um, and I can get those details and that those figures if that's helpful for you uh, to you, um, and I think it goes back to the, the the points that were raised earlier about making sure that the, there is honesty in the approach in which. Uh, messages are given, there's clarity in the messages that are given to children and young people so they absolutely understand it's not their fault that they are going into, uh, into care or need to become looked after uh, and the work that the Who Cares ha have started in terms of trying to destigmatise de some of people's perceptions about young looked after people, about making sure people absolutely understand that it's not their fault, that they it's not their fault that they are in care and that because they are in care that means the responsibility of us all in the wider society to make sure that they can be supported. Um, 
And I think there's work, and I've outlined some of the work that we're doing throughout permanence with the courts and with the legal system as well to make sure decisions are made at a speedier time. And also the work that we're talking about in terms of um, parallel planning to make sure that if you're working with a family, that if there's a, a, a process in place to make sure that if you do need that child needs to be looked after, that that can be done uh, much more quickly, then those are the types of interventions that we want to see happening around the country. And the work that the Warders are doing in terms of the early years collaborative is about making sure that permanence, their stretch aim is all around uh, permanence, early permanence, uh, and doing that in a in a in a quicker time frame, and that is work as well that's I think important to inform the work of the, the, the you as a committee about making sure that we can understand that local authorities are taking this very seriously and we're trying to get things decisions made more quickly, and that's the emphasis of the the bill and all the work that we're doing around looked after children. Just finally on this particular point, um, have we got the balance right in your opinion um, between treating each case as uh, an individual case and Frankly, the practical reality of the situation, which is if one child in that home is in that particular house is being neglected, in all likelihood, the siblings were also, are also being neglected. Um, how do we deal with the issue of, of an individual um, and a decision being taken about an individual to whether to remove them, for example, from the, from the parental home, and looking at the wider circumstances of a family group and two or three or more siblings um, and taking a decision based on the group rather than on the individual? I think you raise an, a very interesting point and a very valid point as well because you know common sense would tell you that there is a need to intervene for that family uh, and making sure that siblings aren't uh, left in any uh, danger or un under any threat and making sure that you can keep the family unit together because you know the, the whole attachment to the family is important as well making sure that children can uh, maintain those sibling bonds is important and if that's not been reflected in decision making then you know we'll take on board that that point and, and make sure that we can enhance that as being something that's a more that's more likely to happen in future because you know it, you know there, there is you know, no getting around it you know if a child has been taken away because of issues around neglect or whatever and there are other fam uh, other family members left in that family then you know common sense would tell you that there's a need to intervene in that the whole family, making sure that you get it right for not just the one child, but for the siblings as well. I, I would agree with you. I mean, I don't, I don't think, I think most of us would agree with you about common sense. But is there, is there a, a strain between common sense on the one hand and the rules under which professionals work in dealing with each case as an individual? I mean, social workers will be aware, or whoever's involved in that family will be aware of the, the, the whole family situation, taking a holistic approach to uh, dealing with one child would require you to make sure that you're taking that holistic approach and making sure that you get it right for not just the one child but for, for all of them because there'll be a duty to make sure every child in that family is uh, is allowed to be supported. So um, if people are describing a strain, then again, like I say, you know, we'll make sure that that's, that's looked at and uh, dealt with in terms of empowering the workforce to make decisions in the best interest of a child and any other subsequent child within that family setting. Because, you know, I think you know, I think we all agree that if you go in and there's one child uh, suffering, that we need to make sure that support is given to any remaining siblings within that group. Okay, thank you very much. Just finally, Minister, you, in your response to the government's response to the committee's interim report, you, you made a number of points. Um, I'll just briefly mention three. You said, we are refreshing the National Child Protection Guidance. Uh, we are reviewing our approach to looked after children and child protection more generally over the long term, and we are also working on a mapping process for the interaction between these complex child support processes and the court system. Uh, do you have a timescale for that work to be completed? Um, because obviously it would be certainly very helpful in terms of our report to make sure that we reflect the work that the government is doing. Guidance is at the end of the year. The mapping process is build ongoing. Time scale, basically, but yes. Build timescale, time so that's ongoing. Um, and what was the other thing? Mapping the, the guidance is at the end of the year. You said you're refreshing the National Child Protection Guidance and then you're reviewing your approach to look after children and child protection more generally in the long term. Yeah, yeah well, that's mapping. part of parcel of the bill and the other kind of timescales that we've got, you know, and, and not least because there are other strands of work going on by uh, being conducted by LACSIG. Um, as well, so it's all done within the kind of timescale of the bill. Uh, the, the guidance, though, will be the end of the year. Well, that's that's helpful. But anything that uh, you or your officials could share with us in advance of the publication of a report in this area would be helpful. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can I thank uh, 
Phil Rains, David Blair and uh, Aileen Campbell, Minister for Children and Young People, for coming along this morning. Uh, that's the end of our oral uh, evidence sessions on our inquiry. Uh, we will, of course, be uh, trying to complete our report over the summer uh, and after the summer recess we will publish that report. So can I thank everybody who has taken part in what has been a, a fairly long inquiry um, and a very interesting piece of work and obviously dealing with an extremely important subject, I'm sure we can all agree. So can I thank everybody who has been involved, not just those who have been here today. And can I suspend briefly? Welcome back. As part of our inquiry, uh, we recently held an informal meeting with children and young people who are going through the care system. This was done in conjunction with Who Cares Scotland and included input from Kibble. Um, it's important that we get the main points of that meeting into the public domain. The clerks, will, uh, you will realise, will have prepared a note of that meeting, which has been agreed by Who Cares Scotland. Uh, and once agreed by members, it will be published on our web pages, uh, along with our other evidence we received. Have mem members got any comments they want to make on the paper, draft paper? Liam. Somebody convener, and I think, uh, as I said previously in the private session, um, we're particularly grateful to the, the input from the young people from Kibble and that we should um, write to them separately, uh, expressing that gratitude. Uh, just for members of the mission, those letters are in preparation at the moment. 
Claire Adamson. Uh, Convener, you did mention um, when we were in private session that you would want additions made to the paper. Um, could you just let us know what those were again? Yes. <laughs> the, the one thing I think we have missed out um, in the paper is the reference that it was, it was referred to in the evidence with the Minister just a moment ago uh, that most young people, if not all of them, uh, stated that they, they felt they should have been taken into care more quickly than they were originally. And I think that's something that should be reflected in the paper. Any other comments on the paper? Well, with, an, with a change to reflect that point, uh, we're happy to publish that then. Yep. Agreed. OK, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, a next item on our agenda this morning. It's our first oral evidence session on the Children and Young People's Scotland Bill. Uh, we will take evidence today from Scottish Government officials. Uh, given the number of issues raised by the bill, there will be two different panels this morning. Uh, the first panel will cover questions on parts one to five of the bill, which includes rights, children's services planning and GIFREC, or getting it right for every child. Uh, we will take further oral evidence in September and October, including uh, uh, with the Minister for Children and Young People. Uh, that meeting will be an opportunity for members to get uh, uh, ministers' views and, of course, comments on the detailed policy decisions. Uh, can I welcome to the committee this morning uh, our first panel? Um, I won't give everybody's title, if you don't mind, because there's rather a lot of you. So I'll just uh, introduce and welcome uh, Elizabeth Campbell, Gordon McNichol, Scott Wood, Boyd, Ad Boyd McAdam, Lynn Townsend and Stuart Robb, all from the Scottish Government. And can I invite Elizabeth to make a, a brief opening statement? Good morning, committee. My name is Elizabeth Campbell and I'm the Bill Team Leader for the Children and Young People Scotland Bill. My colleagues and I are grateful to be here today to discuss the Bill. As the Bill's provisions are quite wide-ranging, a number of officials are here today um, so that we can answer your questions as fully as possible. The Bill is fundamental to the Scottish Government's aim of making Scotland the best place in the world to grow up in. It will put children and young people at the heart of planning and delivery of services and ensure their rights are respected across the public sector. It will ensure that children's rights properly influence the design and delivery of policies and services and increase the powers of Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. It will improve the way services support children and families by promoting cooperation between services. It will strengthen the role of early year support in children's lives by increasing the amount and flexibility of funded early learning and childcare. And it will ensure better permanence planning for looked after children by improving support for kinship carers, families and care leavers, extending corporate parenting across the public sector and putting Scotland's National Adoption Register on a statutory footing. The scale of government's ambition for children, people, children and young people is significant, yet the very strong response to the consultation on the Bill makes clear that the Scottish Government is not alone in holding such high aspirations for the children and young people of this country. The Bill will bring about a step change in the way that all services support children and young people and inspire renewed debate and ambition for what Scotland's children and young people can expect. There is clearly an appetite for this kind of change. My colleagues and I would be delighted to answer questions from the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, can I just remind members, if they want to uh, ask any supplementary questions or any further questions as we go along, please indicate uh, to me. Um, but can I begin with Liz Smith? Uh, good morning. Um, I think we all agree that one of the greatest difficulties and complexities that the committee is uh, grappling with is the issue, uh, part of it is ethical and part of it is legal, about the fact that if we do extend the rights of children, there are implications about the rights for parents or uh, other groups. Um, and I think the committee would welcome uh, some information about what stage the uh, government is at, the Bill team is at, in terms of seeking advice on uh, this area. Um, it's obviously very much part of our uh, briefing notes for this morning that uh, there has been a request when it comes to the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of Children, if that could be incorporated into Scots law. Uh, so could I ask you for uh, some advice uh, as to uh, how you are addressing this issue and uh, at what stage you're at? Yes, absolutely. In, in terms of the... the the rights and responsibilities of parents and balancing them against the rights that children and young people have. The convention itself is quite clear around the responsibility of parents to, to have a primary responsibility in taking the lead role in terms of raising children and young people. So the convention itself is quite, quite clear on that point. Um, in terms of uh, incorporation of the convention, uh, ministers aren't against making targeted 
changes to domestic law which build on the requirements of the UNCRC, and they'll tend to take those changes where they think that the, the change will, uh, will benefit directly children and young people, uh, also where they feel that the, the change will ultimately strengthen our approach to children's rights overall. Uh, ministers aren't supportive of wholesale incorporation of the Convention, and that's where you basically lift the Convention in its entirety and drop it directly into Scots law. Um, ministers don't feel that that would necessarily take us any further forward than we are at the moment. Um, very little evidence has been shared with ministers to, to set out the benefits um, of taking such an approach. Uh, the limited evidence that we have seen would suggest that benefits lie primarily in relation to perhaps improved culture within services and also perhaps increased awareness of uh, children's rights. Now, we, we do want to deliver those types of benefits, but we don't think that wholesale incorporation necessarily represents the, uh, the best, the most effective way of going about that. So, for instance, through this bill, we are looking to improve culture within public services through the effective embedding of getting it right for every child. Um, and that's an approach which builds on the principles of the Convention. We're also taking steps through this bill to place a new duty on Scottish ministers to promote awareness and understanding. So we are trying to deliver those benefits, but we don't think that wholesale incorporation represents the only way or the best way to go about it. In terms of drawbacks associated with wholesale incorporation, we do think there is some risk that that, that could result in far too much emphasis being placed on the courts and on legal processes to, to address the range of issues, often complex issues, which can impact on this agenda. Could I ask then uh, at what stage you would be able to provide us with the uh, legal advice that you have thought? Um, it is appropriate to the decision that you wouldn't incorporate the whole uh, aspect in what stage would you be at to give us that legal advice? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we would be seeking to offer any legal advice to the committee directly on that issue. I think it's a policy decision on the part of ministers around whether or not they would wish to pursue incorporation at this point in time. Just to pursue this, I mean, obviously we have to make a decision about uh, if we do extend the rights of uh, children, um, which is part of the basis, we obviously have to be very clear about the implications of that and whether that has knock-on effects to other rights. What, what I'm driving at is uh, we have to make an informed decision about that, and that does in part depend on legal advice. Uh, if it wasn't the intention of the Bill Committee to provide that, uh, where else would that be forthcoming prior to the start of Stage 1? I mean, I think it's important to, to recognise at this point that we're not actually looking to extend the rights that are available to children and young people. Um, irrespective of whether or not the Convention is incorporated into Scots law, Scottish ministers have a responsibility to implement the UNCRC. Um, what this duty is about is increasing transparency and accountability around how they go about that. So um, it, it's really about requiring the ministers to be able to evidence how they are considering the Convention when they are taking decisions which impact on children and young people. So, sorry, can I just be clear? In some aspects of the bill, particularly something like a named person, is that not increasing the rights of the child? Apologies. Perhaps it's better for, for Boyd or Lynn to, to comment on, on named persons specifically. I was talking in the context of part one of the bill, which focuses specifically on the UNCRC. So um, if it's a question specifically around named person, then perhaps uh, Boyd or Lynn uh, may be better placed to answer that one. I think on the, 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 named, the, the named person provision is set up a framework which is made available to children. It doesn't give children additional rights. It provides a, a, a structure for services to support children. So I think the rights issue is very much in relation to UNCRC, where the rights of parents are recognised in Article 3. It doesn't go into more precision about how you balance those rights, but uh, the UNCRC applies at the present and... There's no intention to adjust or extend that. So there is no intention in the bill to extend the rights of children? No. Thank you. Um, Neil Bibby. Um, a number of organisations have um, requested, I believe, that a children's right impact assessment be carried out on the bill. And I understand this has not been uh, carried out. Could you tell me the reason or the reasons behind, behind that? It's absolutely essential to understand the impact of the Bill on the rights of children and young people and that's why we engaged with over 2,400 of them during the Bill's development. A report on children's views has been published on the Scottish Government website. In addition to that, we carried out an equality impact assessment on the Bill and that looked at the impact on children and young people based on a number of factors including age, gender and religion. We also carried out a non-mandatory privacy impact assessment which looked at the impact on privacy factors for children and their families. If you look at the children, Children's Commissioner's model for a standalone children's rights impact assessment, it says that the point of it is to look at 
and raise awareness of children's interests in the policy or legislation. And I feel by doing the engagement with children and young people and all the other impact assessments and explaining the rationale behind the bill proposals and the policy memorandum, we've covered all of that. We just haven't done it in a separate standalone document, but I think what we've done is more extensive than a standalone document would have done. Um, there's been concerns that potentially parts of the bill could breach the UNCRC around pr privacy, uh, the child's right to privacy, for example, the name person aspect. Uh, as, uh, have you assessed that from the children's rights point of view? But the, um, this is around the impact of the provisions on the, uh, the child and the family, and there is a balance, particularly under Article 8, to respect for family life, but Part of the named person provisions and the information sharing provisions relating to getting information to named persons is always in, couched in terms of proportionate, appropriate and justified. So a practitioner before sharing information has to have a reason for doing so, has to share appropriate information with the right person. This is under the Data Protection Act at the moment. And we feel that the provisions there, given that proportionality element, are compliant with uh, ECHR and the UNCRC. Um, and on the issue of um, children's rights, I understand before the consultation it was proposed that um, there was going to be a due regard to the UNCRC. And uh, people in the consultation responded to say that it should be uh, strengthened, but after the consultation um, it's now going to say keep under consideration. Can, can you tell me the reasons why it was it was changed? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of points to that one. The first of is uh, of which would focus on the views which were expressed by stakeholders in relation to our proposals. Uh, when we consulted on proposals to legislate in the area of children's rights last year, about 70 per cent of those who responded to the consultation agreed that the proposals we had set out would uh, help to strengthen in, uh, transparency and accountability around uh, Minister's approach to, to, to the UNCRC. Um, only about 15 per cent of the respondents to the consultation highlighted that they felt the, the proposals didn't go far enough um, and that they would perhaps like to see incorporation. So I think that kind of suggests to us certainly that we've got the focus about right in terms of uh, the, the nature of the duties that we're seeking to place on Ministers through the Bill. In terms of uh, a due regard duty, it's important whenever we're introducing a new duty on, on ministers and anybody else that we are very clear about the impact that that duty is likely to have. And we don't feel that we have that clarity in respect of a, a due regard duty. Uh, the, the concept of having due regard to a piece of international law is, is a new one in Scotland. There's, there's no legal precedent for it uh, and there's no case law which supports us in understanding how the courts might interpret a duty of that nature. Now, um, we think that that lack of clarity is an unnecessary risk in this instance, and what we've sought to do through the Bill is to uh, formulate a duty which accurately reflects exactly what it is that Ministers are looking to deliver. Uh, Liam MacArthur, is that supplementary uh, on this area? Yeah, 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 it's just, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying in relation to um, the non-incorporation of the, the UNCRC, um, but I think I'm right in saying that you reflected as one of the potential benefits would be some cultural change. You know, we've heard from the Minister this morning in relation to um, Im improving uh, outcomes for looked after children, the importance of cultural change and therefore I, I wouldn't um, think it's terribly helpful to, to downgrade the importance of that um, uh, cultural yes. change and therefore I, I, I'm still kind of trying to get my head around why it is that um, uh, ministers have decided um, to not incorporate and, and in a sense to, to cherry pick the elements of the UNCRC that they, they, they see a need to, uh, to implement through the legislation. Yeah. Um, I suppose one of the things to, to, to factor in is that the limited, evidences, uh, li lim limited evidence which has been presented to ministers suggests that there may be benefits in terms of culture change and improved awareness and understanding, but we do feel that it would be beneficial to have a more robust evidence base on which to form any future view about incorporation. Um, I think the other thing that we have to do is to, to weigh up the, ve the benefits against the potential risks of incorporating the Convention. And as I say, we do feel that there is potential for incorporation to place far too much emphasis on the courts and on legal processes. And we certainly don't want to end up in a place whereby the courts are considered the go-to forum for addressing the range of issues which impact on children in Scotland. So it's a case of weighing up those benefits against the risks. And given that we think we can deliver many of those benefits through uh, other avenues, through other provisions which are set out in this bill, we don't think that incorporation represents the best way to progress the rights agenda at this point in time. If you, if you were to put them in legislation, presumably there's still a risk that would end up in the courts uh, ultimately. 
ultimately in any way in, in, in terms of testing um, the, the legal status of whatever right it is? I think it depends on the focus of the duty that you're introducing. I don't know if there's anything you would want to add on that, Gordon. Certainly it's correct. <coughs> Excuse me. Certainly it's correct, yes. If you impose any duty on anybody, uh, on ministers particularly, then there is a risk of litigation because someone will argue that ministers have failed to fulfil whatever duty has been imposed on them. Uh, the, the, the position that ministers have taken, however, is that... Um, as, as has been explained, the, the, the focus is on education, on changing culture, and that is considered to be best achieved by taking the approach that's been taken in this bill. Um, what ministers don't want to see, um, or would prefer not to see, is, is the emphasis on litigation pursuit through the courts of rights, which um, should more properly be developed, in their view, be developed um, through education, through change of culture. But in terms of having identified potential benefits, albeit not necessarily as robust an evidence base as, as you may have um, wished to see, um, is it fair to say that through the evidence process that we're embarking upon now, uh, that there's still a willingness um, uh, for ministers to, to look again at this issue if that evidence were to be put forward? I mean, I, I think it would probably be premature of us to see what Minister's future view might be in light of emerging evidence, but I can certainly state that based on the evidence Ministers have seen to date, their views that incorporation doesn't represent the best way to progress this agenda at this time. Go so Finlay. It's always dangerous to ask a question you don't know the answer to, but I'm going to anyway. Um, which other countries have uh, uh, carried out full incorporation? Can you give me some examples? Yeah, we don't have uh, an exhaustive list. I know that um, Ireland have recently made changes to uh, their constitution to... Um, embed more effectively rights within that constitution. Uh, there was a piece of research undertaken by UNICEF um, last year which looked at uh, the approach to legal implementation of the convention in a, a, a 12 countries in total. Um, now three of those 12 countries uh, had actually taken the, the step of incorporating the convention into law. Uh, we don't have an exhaustive list of the, the, the range of countries who have taken this forward, but certainly what I would be happy to do is share the, the UNICEF report with committee members, if that would be helpful, so you can see the range of different approaches which have been adopted uh, in order to progress this issue. Thanks. Okay. Liz, did you have a... I was going to say, I would have thought that would be very helpful. Actually. Yes, yeah, I, I'm sure it would be. Um, can, before we move on, can I just uh, just clarify something? The bill also gives the commissioners, uh, the children's commissioner, I should say, uh, powers to undertake uh, investigations into individual cases. Um, now, this was pushed for I think way back in 2003 when the children's commissioner came into, came into being. Uh, it didn't happen at that time. Um, could you just clarify what the difference is in, uh, now in terms of the children's commissioner's ability to under, undertake investigations? I could certainly talk a bit about the process which led to the development of the provisions which are included in the legislation. Uh, when ministers first brought forward proposals to legislate in the area of children's rights, they never included a proposal to extend the powers available to the Commissioner. Um, now, even without asking that question, a significant number of stakeholders came back to us suggesting that we should actively consider including provision in the Bill focusing on this. Um, so we listened to that and we did develop a set of proposals which were set out in the consultation paper focusing on this Bill which was published last June. Again, the majority of respondents came back suggesting that uh, there was scope for this new investigatory function to offer direct benefit to children and young people, but also broader learning in terms of uh, practice within frontline services. Now, since then, we've, uh, we've had a number of conversations with those other complaints handling bodies which operate in Scotland in order to better understand how uh, the Commissioner's investigatory power might add value and also how it should align with the range of other complaints handling processes which are in place because we don't want to, to duplicate activity. Now, the, the feedback we've had is that, that uh, by and large, there is consensus across the complaints handling bodies that uh, there is certainly scope for this new investigatory power to, to add benefit uh, to children and young people. Um, in terms of how we think the investigation function should be exercised, we think it should be used in a fairly targeted and strategic way. So um, that's based on the premise that we already have a fairly com a robust complaints handling landscape in Scotland. So there are fairly limited instances we expect where it would be necessary for the Commissioner to intervene. Now, um, we think that any investigation should obviously offer benefit to the child or young person in question, but we also think that it should offer le uh, wider learning for the sector. And al also, investigations should be targeted in such a way as to inform the wider work of the Commissioner's office. So it should be quite a strategic approach in our view. We recognise it would be helpful to the committee to have sort of 
particular examples, I suppose, of the types of investigations that the Commissioner might be involved in. And we recently held a meeting with the complaints handling bodies and the Commissioner, where it was agreed that they would develop some of those examples over the summer with a view to um, perhaps sharing them with the committee uh, towards the end of the recess period. That, again, that would be helpful. I just, I just want to clarify, though, that clearly, the bill, the bill, as the bill stands, it proposes that these investigations um, effectively can only be undertaken where it doesn't overlap yes. with the work of others. Uh, so I am struggling at a moment because there are, a, there are a, a number of bodies that undertake work in this area. So those examples would be helpful, I think, in, in allowing us to understand what exactly the added value is. Absolutely. We'll be happy to share those when, as and when they become Thank available. Thank you very much. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. Just as an addendum to that, I mean, it, it would be helpful. Obviously, the Finance Committee are going to be looking at the Finance Memorandum for the for the bill, yes. but actually if there's an agreed understanding of what the level of that activity will be and therefore the cost implications um, would, be, uh, would be very helpful. Yeah, um, absolutely. The, the estimate that we set out in the Financial Memorandum was based on the premise that the Commissioner would undertake a, a fairly small number of investigations each year. The, the, the assumption was between one and four investigations per year, um, and we've based our financial estimates on on that assumption. And certainly we have, we, have, we have shared that assumption with the Commissioner um, and that's been the basis for our discussions up until now. Okay. Could I maybe turn to um, the issue of Griffick now? I mean, obviously um, the, the Bill looks to put this on a, a statutory footing um, policy that's been in place since, uh, since 2006. Um, it would be, I think we heard from the, the Minister during the earlier evidence session uh, on a number of occasions the value she saw uh, in terms of, of, of that move. Um, in providing a, a consistency of, of, of approach. Could you perhaps uh, explain where um, to date there has been uh, inconsistencies, that in geographic areas where best practice hasn't been applied as it, as it might have, and this is clearly relevant to the inquiry we're drawing to a, a conclusion as well as the bill we're about to embark upon? If I may, um, the Gurfec Programme Board has set up an implementation working group under that, and they are currently uh, engaging with community planning partnerships to get a better feel of where uh, each area is in uh, respect of implementing getting it right. And we're, we're at a level everyone has got corporate buy-in. Most areas are in the process of implementing the new processes into their key business areas and uh, two or three feel that they have progressed implementation to the point that they are comfortable that they are at a point where they could uh, comply with the proposed duties under the bill. The areas that uh, are coming back, uh, looking for further assistance, are looking for more information and information sharing, uh, materials around uh, training uh, to help staff understand what should we, how you move forward in a consistent way. And the Lynn Townsend may speak a bit more about the work we're doing in terms of developing guidance, but we're also proposing a national training event within the next six to eight months to help people understand how they progress. Um, it's. We haven't particularly, I, there's a report that's just gone out from the implementation working group and again we can share that uh, with the committee. Uh, we are not identifying particular areas, everyone's at a different stage in their journey. Um, but the, uh, the key message is that work is well underway and they anticipate by about this time next year they will be well advanced in implementing getting it right. They've been there in a sense, um, wouldn't necessarily require legislation. I mean, I appreciate it's a response to the legislation. Could you perhaps uh, explain what the, the rationale was for going down a legislative route rather than kind of buttressing the, the, the policy guidance and the training and all the rest of it around that? One of the, the feedback as we've progressed implementation is that people keep looking for a structure within which all this activity takes place. And um, ministers were concerned that the progress in implementation was not as fast as we might have anticipated. As you said, it's been around since 2005-06. The actual uh, GERFEC approach was really finalised in 2009-10, following the Pathfinder um, work in Highland and the Learning Partnerships. But the, we have been advocating change, but it, people need that help to move forward. It, it, it is part of the big culture change that we're talking about under rights, and it does require a lot of planning, a lot of process, a lot of leadership. And the bill provides that framework within which all of this can happen. So there is clarity about the role of the named person. There's clarity around when information should be shared. Uh, and those are the provisions that we feel should go in legislation, but there's still a lot of activity around guidance, helping people understand what they need to do, and that's work that, that is ongoing. 
We heard earlier about the the, uh, the, the concerns about um, not the wholesale um, integration of UNCRC into the, the legislation. I think I'm right in saying that uh, we're not seeing wholesale integration of GERFIC into legislation either. I, I think um, the, the absence of legislation for the lead professional to take over in complex cases from a um, named person is, is, is one of the examples I think has been cited. Is there a potential problem here that what we have is some of GERFIC with a legislative statutory underpinning uh, and some of it not in terms of providing the cons consistency that clearly the, the Minister uh, attaches quite a considerable value to given our evidence this morning? We describe the, uh, the provisions of the Bill as the key elements of getting it right and those on which we can legislate. It is a combination of practices change, systems change and culture change. Sorry, sorry. And, but yeah. it, it, it's where we can legislate. That tends to suggest that um, this, is, this is a question of, of what lends itself to legislation as opposed to a, a policy choice. And the lead professional dimension would appear to be more a policy choice than necessarily something you can't legislate for because you've, you're legislating for the named person, for example. The rationale is that the named person is located within universal services of health and education, and you can place a statutory responsibility on those bodies to make arrangements to provide for a named person. The lead professional is someone who should be best placed to address the needs and risk of the child, who can be drawn from any particular service, not necessarily health, not necessarily education, uh, and therefore it is difficult to place a duty on an individual body to make the arrangements for the lead professional. That, we believe, is best sorted out by protocols within a community planning partnership across agencies as to how that system will work. Is there not, though, a risk that, in a sense, you've created a two-tier um, dimension to GERFIC, that there's some that has statutory underpinning and, and, and some of it doesn't, and therefore there's always going to be a gravitational pull to the, to the elements that, that are statutory um, provided for, um, and that actually where the inconsistencies will now arise is those areas in, in, in relation to the, the, to the non-statutory elements, whether it's lead professional or, or other aspects? I think achieving the consistency is why the guidance uh, groups that are being developed, we're working with stakeholders from across all the services to ensure that what emerges is something they are confident in, will make a difference and will deliver that consistency. Lynn might wish to mention a bit more about the guidance, but it is, it is a combination of statute and guidance. There's, Yes, um, the provisions within the bill uh, which cover child's plan and named person, the policy view was that the role of the lead professional falls from both of those duties. And interestingly, in terms of implementation, most areas are already quite happy with the role of lead professional because it's a role that has been around in practice for a number of years where there's been integrated assessment framework uh, in practice. And certainly in the guidance, we'll be addressing the issues of managing the plan and the uh, lead professional role will feature in how we, how we frame the guidance. Thank you very much. Uh, Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Camilla. Um, the bill uh, introduces a statutory definition of well-being in Part 13. And given that welfare is already included in the Children's Act, could you explain what the differences are between welfare and well-being and why a statutory definition of well-being is required? I think part of the challenge that's been faced over the past 15 years or so is that welfare, as provided for in legislation, has been interpreted around the vulnerability, the child protection element. And part of the practice that uh, has emerged and was recognised in the 2001 report for Scotland's children and the subsequent one on it's everyone's job to make sure I'm all right, is that practice was operating with thresholds and children and young people were not getting the service they required until that threshold had been reached. Part of what we're trying, seeking to achieve with this bill is to promote early intervention and prevention. And by adopting this concept of well-being, a more holistic approach, that should encourage people to identify concerns at an earlier level. It's trying to shift the mindset. I think in legal terms, uh, my colleague might advise, but there's maybe not that much difference between welfare and well-being. But what we are proposing in the bill is a definition of well-being. Welfare isn't defined in existing legislation. And part of what we're trying to bring about is this 
culture change and early intervention. Do you want to move on to a named person? Certainly. Um, convener. Um, there's been mention already about the named person role, but it's perhaps one of the things that's um, hit a lot of headlines and, and a, a bit of confusion about, about what that, that that means. And I wondered if you could just give us a, a sort of very brief definition of the named person and what their duties will be. Yes, the named person, um, as Boyd said earlier, will be somebody within the Universal Services of Health or education. Um, health boards will have that responsibility up to five and from five to 18 it will fall to um, the local authority. And in some ways you can see the named person as facing in two directions. So the named person will be there to um, be a point of contact for the child and the family to offer advice and support and help them negotiate their way through systems, gain access um, to services. But the other side of the named person role is in terms of the wider world. Um, and they would be there again as that recognised point of contact where others may have a concern about well-being. And that's based, I think, on what we know from experience and research around people sometimes having concerns around well-being or aspects of a, a child's um, development that don't somehow breach a threshold that they feel they can go to somebody with. But with the named person in place, they would have somebody to go with within universal services who would have an overview of the child and be able to take the piece of the jigsaw, the information that the other person have, bring it together with what they know and make a judgment as to whether there was cause for concern. So that's really the main kind of functions of the named person. And in some ways, the other, bit, the other thing to think about is it's quite a layered role. So the named person, both in health and in education, has a role in terms of every child. So it's about making sure the culture um, within the establishment in education or within the way that the health visitor, for example, is working, um, has that holistic view of the child and well-being, not just the people in front of you or the patient. Um, so it has a benefit to every child, but the named person would also then um, have a role where a concern did emerge to look and see whether uh, they were able, they had the information, they were able to offer um, support within the universal service from within the resources available to them or whether they need to look beyond their agency or service to the wider multi-agency um, arena for resources and support. And again, they would be the person who could support the child and family through that process, take it into a multi-agency arena and then look to the lead professional to coordinate where you were looking at multi-agency um, targeted interventions. If I, if I may just add, I think the holistic overview of the child and all the irrelevant information is quite important. We've uh, developed a training exercise called Gerfex Cludo, where people play the roles of practitioners and certain information is available. And it's interesting that when that is carried out, uh, false assumptions are made about what's going on in that child's life because you only have partial information. So it's... It's getting that overall picture so you can understand what is relevant, what's appropriate, and where the right help can be targeted. Because if you have a false perception, the type of intervention that's going to be proposed will be wrong and may be interfering with the family life. Um, could I ask a supplementary? Mm, Thank you, convener. Um, we well, had a bit of information um, in the financial memorandum about resources, but it, it's very much based on time. And um, if, if you could steer clear from, because one of my colleagues I know is going to ask about the statutory duty on, on, on data sharing, but obviously um, key to that is consistency of where that data will be collected and how that can be consistent across the country so that, as you say, that you know that the same decisions have been made in, in different local authorities. And given that it's likely to be health boards and education departments that are dealing with this, do, do you envisage that a common data storage mechanism or a best practice of data storage will have to be developed? 
the, the fundamental approach is that we're not creating a central database where information is stored. The approach is very much that agencies will continue to be responsible for the information they hold. So a health professional will have information on their system, a teacher will have it on their system. What we need to ensure is that the relevant bits come together, but not stored centrally, um, because it should be brought together for a particular purpose, for a reason to address a concern and to help inform the professional judgment. Um, they, there's been work done in the Airshares. Um, they've developed a programme um, called Airshare, which facilitates that bringing together of information electronically. But that is, again, for a particular purpose and within a locality. There's no proposal to have a central database. We may specify minimum data sets so that you can capture the relevant information that everyone needs to know but that would be a minimum, but again, uh, proportionate sharing. Thanks. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that, that the in person would be um, a, a, a member of education personnel from 5 to 18. Um, in terms of a practical question, how, how do you expect um, educational personnel, usually teachers, to act as a named person? during the 12 weeks that they're on holiday. Say, for example, a child goes missing during the summer holidays or there's an incident that affects the child during the summer holidays. How, how's the teacher going to be that kind of named person and point of contact during, during those periods? The duty in the bill will be on the local authority and it will be up to the local authority to make arrangements, put arrangements in place to make the named person available. And during the holidays, they'll build on current practice because what happens at the moment in local authorities is there's somebody centrally based within the education service. And in the instance you're talking about, a child going missing, then they would be the point of contact there. That's an emergency situation. People have access to the school records, the information, and they would take um, play a role in that multi-agency response to an emergency situation. Situations that aren't an emergency where a parent um, is looking for information about a course or about what's going to be happening in the school uh, at the start of the new session, again, there will be centrally deployed officers within every education department who would be able to offer that non-urgent advice. Um, where parents or others wish to raise issues which, again, weren't urgent, they could be held until the named person within the school um, came back. So it will be for local authorities to put those arrangements in place, but that's how we envisage it working, and we've had those discussions with stakeholders. And, and in terms of um, the impact that that has on staff, staff workloads, um, for example, you could have a school that has 250 pupils with only 12 members of staff. Now, that would be in term time. In terms of uh, what consideration has been given to the impact on, on, on staff workload, and also in terms of, you know, say, in holiday periods, um, that seems like 250, you know, uh, what would be the kind of what would be the kind of the ratio that you would be looking at? You know, obviously you could have a teacher per class, but what would be the sort of ratio outside of of kind of term time you would be looking at if, if the local authority was to have a kind of another person to cover that name person role, as it were? Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to the concept I was I was describing earlier in terms of that layered approach for the named person in a school of two hundred and fifty children the vast majority of those children will receive all the help and support they need from their class teacher and the other services that are just available in the school. And it's unlikely that people would have to, the name person would have to take any action over and above their, their current duties. But the other bit that we also, um, that the bill is predicated on is already within education, um, there are statutory duties around planning assessing children, planning and supporting children. So that, that work goes on currently. And really what the bill proposes is an overarching framework within which that level of assessment and support um, will go on. So in terms of, I mean, it's very difficult to say. It will depend where the school is, what the current practice within that school is. But during the school holidays, you, you certainly wouldn't be expecting... 250 inquiries to any centrally based officer around those children and their well-being. 
Um, two, yeah, just two quick questions, one from Neil and uh, one from Liz. What, uh, how many um, pupils would the, the named person in a school uh, be responsible for? Um, it is, it'll be up, as I said, it'll be up to education authorities to decide how they make the arrangements for named person. But from the experience we have so far, it is likely that it'll be the head teacher who will be named as the named person. And that's particularly so that the outside world knows who the named person is. But within a primary school, we would envisage that aspects of that role will be delegated to deputy and principal teacher level. And similarly, in a secondary school, as is current practice, there will be deputy heads with a pupil support um, portfolio and pastoral care staff who, again, will know the young people and be currently involved in offering support. So we envisage that's how it will operate. So, the, sorry, the, so, the, so the, the, the named person is the head teacher in a primary school? And I would imagine in the secondary school also, from the purposes of people knowing who to contact. Therefore, that follows on to the, the point that says that after the first year, teachers will not need any extra hours to act as a named person. Now, knowing the workload that head teachers do at present, I find that absolutely remarkable. Yes, when, when we looked at the issues around capacity, um, because the policy has been in place for a, a number of years and because some local authorities are already implementing, it's very difficult to say definitively what the resource implications will be. However, the workload that you describe of head teachers, deputy heads, pastoral care staff currently is around looking after young people, um, assessing, working with others, putting support in, working in a multi-agency forum, going to children's panels. Now, what we have looked at is a systems change burden, if you like. So at the moment, people work in a particular way. We're asking through getting it right for them to shift some of the ways that they work. Um, and that usually brings an additional burden, hence the, the years kind of transition. But there are benefits to the new way of working, and that came out through the Highland Pathfinder. So there should be fewer meetings, fewer reports. Um, there should be a more coordinated approach to children having to go to children's panels. So we expect that there will be benefits. Thank you. Liz. Could I just ask what provision is made in the private sector, which obviously includes quite a few special schools, um, and obviously there's no local authority involved there? Within the bill, um, we've put parallel duties on to independent and grant-aided schools. Some of the independent schools will be private schools, and it would be for the proprietor of the private school to put the arrangements in place for named person, child's plan, and parallel to the duties of the local authority. Where the school is a special school, um, the young people will be placed by a local authority. So you will... Early. So some special schools have children from both sectors. Yeah. Um, the special school will, that will operate a named person um, system arrangements in the same way as the local authority. If they are a private special school and the children are not placed by the local authority but they require a multi-agency approach, then again there would need to be a lead professional who may well be in a public service supporting that young person. For the special schools where the local authority has made the placement, again they would hold the responsibility through the lead professional role. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Convener. Um, my questions are about the statutory duty to share information, and this is a subject that we have looked at quite extensively in our two inquiries into looked after children. And it seems uh, certainly to me, it seems to me that there's a lot of confusion amongst uh, professionals at, as things stand at the moment as to when they can share information about about a child. Um, some professionals think it it's only when a child is actually formally on the at-risk register and as you have outlined we really need to be able to intervene earlier um, uh, to ensure that we nip things in the bud. However, um, that does th throw up an issue around ECHR 
and the rights, uh, the rights to privacy. Now, you mentioned Gerfet Cludo. I, I actually played Gerfet Cludo at a, a government event uh, recently, um, when each table um, is a different person in the child's life, a childminder, uh, father, mother, uh, school, and they each have a different piece of information. And uh, it highlights the difficulty of sharing that information. Uh, but in this particular case, the one, the Gerfet Cludo that I played, the crucial piece of information was held by the mother's GP and it related to the mother's mental health. Now, under the new arrangements, uh, can the GP still, sh can he share that information about the mother's mental health with perhaps the school teacher or the child's health visitor without being in breach of ECHR? I'm not sure how, it can, how they can still do that. It's a complex area. I think Article 8 and the right to privacy and family life doesn't give a blanket exemption from families, I think the first point. Um, the existing law, irrespective of what's proposed in the bill, uh, there's a lot of issues around the Data Protection Act and whether people feel, professionals feel they are able to share information either because of breach of confidentiality um, or because of um, professional practice. And the Information Commissioner's Office in Scotland in April clarified that under existing law, if there is a concern of risk to harm to the future well-being of the child, then the practitioner should share if it's proportionate. So it does come down to professional judgment. Uh, in the case you cited, I think if uh, the GP had concerns that the mental well-being of the mother was impacting to, uh, adversely on the child, I think the expectation is that should be shared with the named person who is a professional uh, within universal services. Um, I don't know if my colleague wants to talk a bit more about Article 8, and, uh, but part of that, I think, is to avoid making all of that information public. But you're do what we're seeking to do is clarify that there is a responsibility to inform the named person where you think that concern is impacting on the child and they may be on a risk uh, to well-being. So it's a judgment at a call. But in terms of the, the legal the legal position, Absolutely. would you would you not expect those professionals to be open to legal challenge? Yes. Oh, um, Gordon, do you want to <coughs> talk? I don't think we can talk about this in abstract because, as Boyd said, it all depends on the circumstances of the individual case. Yes, of course, if there's, there really is no serious threat to the child's well-being and the GP decides to tell all and sundry about the, 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 her, his, his or her patient's um, difficulties, then yes, there would be a risk of challenge, uh, quite a serious risk of challenge, and probably justifiably so. Um, as I say, you can't... You can't make absolute rules as to when someone can or cannot share because it depends on the circumstances, it depends why you're doing it. And all that we can say is that Article 8 and the Data, Data Protection Act do not absolutely prohibit something like sharing of information. Um, the Article 8 is not an absolute right to privacy. Um, there are circumstances in which um, that right doesn't apply. and. Um, it will depend on the individual circumstances whether whether that's that's the case or not. Well, if I can go back to the Gerfet Cludo, um, I, the role that I played in the Gerfet Cludo, I was a childminder, and the the mum had started bringing the child in late, and the child seemed a bit more clingy, um, and I thought something perhaps might not be quite right, but the mum said she had a lot of work. Now that doesn't seem to me, although there was a serious issue in that hypothetical case. It doesn't seem to me that that childminder would feel confident that you know coming in late and 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 having a clingy child would would necessitate having to go and share information and breach that mother's confidentiality. Let alone then go to the GP and find out whether the mother had a mental health problem. I think in that situation you're describing, it's it's doubtful that you're either if if if. If the childminder has concerns that the child seems clingy, for example, to take that example, I can't see that you're actually disclosing personal data relating to the mother, uh, personal data even relating to the child. You're just making an observation that you seeing this child coming in every day doesn't seem quite right. 
so I'm not sure that, and again, I don't see that there's an Article 8 issue there. You're not disclosing any personal information regarding your child. You're just making an observation about how the child appears to you and possibly to the population at large. If they, if they knew the child well, well enough, they would realise that. So, I'm sorry to press the case, but if, if, there's a, if there's a named person and the childminder goes to the named person with that information, which doesn't seem particularly serious. The whole point of the evidence, the whole point of the exercise would be that the named person should then be able to go to the GP. The GP has the crucial information that the yeah. mother has a historical mental health problem. So, you know, that, that child's well-being was at stake, but um, you can also see how by going with the childminder's information to the GP, that doesn't perhaps stand up in, in terms of breaching privacy if you don't have the full picture. Do you see what I'm getting at? It depends on the circumstances. Um, it's, it's impossible to say um, in abstract, yes, you can or no, you can't share the information. It depends on, on the circumstances and the extent to which there is perceived to be a risk to the, the child's well-being. Case that what we're trying to do here, which is anticipate problems, um, which may or may not exist, um, will inevitably lead to breaches of privacy. And it's perhaps we should be honest about that and say we will have breaches of privacy um, for you know quite a lot of families um, in order to protect those children who are at risk. I think part of the early intervention agenda does require you to pick up those concerns earlier, but the, the structure that's proposed is to do so in a framework that relies on the professional taking what is a proportionate judgment. And I think if that view is that there is a concern there that I am not comfortable with, the data protection advice is you should share. So under data protection, then that I think that that is covered because it is a professional judgment and the practice has to be you record the reason you're sharing it, you explain why you think that's a concern uh, and it is done within that structure of the named person taking a view. But all the evidence uh, it exists that information is known and not necessarily put together and the named person provides that overview. The decision may be not to go any further with it in the light of what the named person knows but if that concern is providing evidence that there is something not right in that child's life, then that's where the, the duties and public bodies to safeguard children and to put their right, their welfare, well-being as paramount cuts in. It's, it's the what-you-don't-know issue, but it should be done within an environment that is proportionate and secure, avoiding more public knowledge about uh, what's going on in the family's life. But... If professionals are going to make the judgment, they have to be aware of what's going on. And presumably they have to be aware that they'll be open, they could be open to legal challenge. Yeah. Okay. I would move on, I'm very aware of time. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Bill provides for a number of additional plans and reports to be produced by a range of organisations, and these relate to all sorts of things like children's rights, corporate parenting, children's services, early education, individual child plan. Now, it seems that it's going to be the local authorities and uh, maybe the local health boards that are required to provide most of these. Other agencies report on other things. Now, is this not just increasing the bureaucracy? Is this not putting more layers on top of uh, what's already there? How are, how are local authorities and so on going to cope with this? I'll answer that question. Um, you're right, there are a number of reporting and planning duties contained within the bill. It's important to say that these duties were broadly supported by stakeholders through the consultation and subsequent engagement. Now, we've been very clear through the development of the bill that we don't want to place extra burdens unnecessarily on agencies or organisations, and we certainly don't want to increase bureaucracy. So, a number of the reports contained in the bill, rather than creating bespoke new reporting mechanisms, we are expecting organisations to use current reporting mechanisms. So, for example, for the rights duty on the public sector, Organisations can use current annual reports to include stuff on rights in that. 
in terms of the children's services planning duty, that actually replaces a previous planning process, so it's not creating an additional new one, it's replacing another one. And also for the single child's plan, that's actually been proven in the Highland Pathfinder and other areas to reduce paperwork and reduce bureaucracy and burdens. So actually, rather than increase bureaucracy, several aspects of the bill seek to reduce it. But overall, will it increase the burden of paperwork or will it reduce it? I think it probably all balances out. Actually, there are some new processes replacing old processes, so it certainly shouldn't increase the bureaucracy. OK, thank you very much. I mean, I think there's a number of issues we will, I think, um, follow up in writing, if you don't mind. But can I thank you very much for coming along this morning, and I'll suspend briefly while we change the panels. Uh, our second panel this morning will be answering questions on parts 6 to 13 of the bill, which covers early learning and childcare, looked after children, children's hearings and schools consultation. Um, can I welcome Elizabeth Campbell, who's stayed with us. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for staying with us. Can I welcome back David Blair, who was with us earlier. Uh, and, but can I also welcome Kit Wyeth, Ruth Ingalls, uh, Susan Bolt and Claire Morley, uh, all from the Scottish Government, who have joined as this morning for the second panel. Uh, we'll get straight into questions, if you don't mind, with uh, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Can I turn to the issue of uh, child care provision? Obviously, the, the bill looks to set in statute and extend uh, the number of hours of, of child care that uh, are provided for. It, it talks about um, a, a definition of early learning and care. It would be um, useful to know whether uh, service provision would have to uh, include learning and care, um, rather than either education or care. I think I'm right in saying that the bill amends existing definition of school education uh, to include early learning and care. So it'd be, it'd be useful to know um, what is actually changing as a result of that and what the expectation would be. 
Okay, um, yeah, the expectation is that it would cover um, learning and care. Um, the definition in the Bill of Early Learning and Child Care is to a, a service that provides education and care um, that promotes and supports learning and development in a nurturing and caring environment or, or setting. So it's seeing the two concepts as indivisible. Um, the Where um, education and care are integrated, you get higher quality. And that's why um, OECD and the European Commission strongly support and promote models of integrated education and care. Um, we're calling it learning and care because it, it fits with the, the policy on, on the learning journey. But it's it's that model um, that, that we're, we're following. Um, so there would be an expectation that wherever there's there's learning, it's done within a nurturing, caring environment, and we would also want caring to be seen um, as consisting of you know activities and interactions that are um, also supporting learning. Um, it reflects current good practice in Scotland. Um, we're we're trying to move from a model where you might. Um, see um, a block of education, you know, the preschool might be currently two and a half hours a day. Um, so you've got two and a half hour block of education and then that's topped up by care, which might be seen as less important um, to education. We're trying to move away from that model. So for example, for children who are in, um, say, half day sessions or full day sessions in, in a nursery, you wouldn't expect to see education starting at a point in the day finishing two hours later, and then the interactions and activities and relationships all changing to something different called care. So it's about promoting a, a consistent, high-quality provision for the child wherever their formal early learning and child care takes place and whoever's delivering it. So that's what the aim is um, in terms of um, using that new definition. That's, that, that's very helpful. One of the issues that's been raised, and again we'll probably um, come back to this in relation to the financial memorandum, is the extent to which um, the, 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 the statutory allocation of 600 hours is fully funded. Is, is it your um, understanding that that... That is the case. Yes, yes. I, the, the, the point about funding was made by Save the Children and others. One of the other points Save the Children uh, made in their uh, written evidence, initial written evidence to us, um, I picked up a point, I think, from the Equal Opportunities Committee about the, the broader nature um, of, uh, of care that's required both in terms of learning and, and, and early learning and childcare, but also out of school care as well. I think that's something that all of us as committee members have picked up through various um, uh, different kind of fora. I, to what extent or what consideration was given to um, uh, the, 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 the including a broader definition of care and, and putting that on a on a statutory footing? Um, yeah, I mean, the definition of of early learning and um, care would apply broadly to um, formal early learning and child care. We're still um, grappling with de definitions. We have um, the government is committed to. Um, developing and increasing early learning and child care that covers all children of all ages and meets the needs of those children as well as the needs of parents and families. So there's more work being done on that um, beyond the bill itself and the work in the bill through the definitions will support um, improving quality and provision that isn't necessarily covered by the bill. Um, the other, I mean, what's the reason for delaying the night? Is that is it a, 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 a budgetary rationale, or is it is it a concern that um, out of school care isn't as well understood or defined as as early learning and care, and therefore more work needs to be done? Um, I, I don't think there's a concern there. I think the government has the aim to improve and increase for all. The bills decided, um, ministers have decided to focus and prioritise on building up the high quality universal preschool system that exists at the moment and to build additional hours into it and build additional flexibility. Um, and that's a significant change that's being asked of local authorities to do that. Um, we are doing work more widely on out of school care, for example, we have a working group, which is a, a subgroup of the Early Years Task Force, which is looking at the child care for all. Um, and they would, um, it includes all partners who support organisations to develop a wider range of provisions. So um, it could be staff banks, it could be childminders, um, it could be out of school care. So um, 
we've we're funding um, a number of these organisations like the Scottish Out of School Care Network. Um, the National Day Nursery Association, the Scottish Childminders Association, CALA, which is a social enterprise, because all these organisations share the same aims of increasing and improving and increasing the range of models that deliver the range of care for different age groups. So it's just that that isn't focused through the bill, but there is work going on in parallel um, to do that as well. Just to roll back in terms of, of, of the age spectrum um, uh, obviously there is provision within the, the bill for uh, some uh, two year olds, those who are looked after, I think some within kinship care as well which which is welcome but I, I think what we've heard um, from the Minister this morning was uh, a very heavy emphasis on, on early intervention and again Save the Children make the point that um, they are somewhat disappointed that the, the bill doesn't look to extend that um, provision for two year olds uh, further to those from um, the, the least, least advantaged uh, or the most disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. Could you maybe explain why that hasn't um, been incorporated within the bill, whether or not there is still an open mind as we, as we take evidence on the bill to, to go back and look at that again? Okay. Um, the rationale for focusing on the looked after twos um, is that the looked after children have got the, the worst outcomes and the risk of wor worst outcomes of any group of children. Um, and what the bill is proposing is um, guaranteeing a minimum sustained early learning and childcare provision for those children. Also focusing on kinship care two-year-olds because they're often at risk so we can prevent children becoming looked after or we can provide a, a positive solution for bringing them out of, of being looked after. So there's a very specific focus on that. Um, the provision for looked after twos will be um, flexible to their individual needs. It will look at their family circumstances. Um, it can... It allows for different models and arrangements so that if, if it means working on a one-to-one -one with parents or in certain programmes, that would be OK if, if it met the, the, the needs and the, the well-being of, of the child. In terms of the, the broader um, two-year-olds who might come from um, more deprived or, or poorer backgrounds, the evidence is very strong that um, children from poorer backgrounds or poorer home learning environments benefit more from universal provision. Um, there's a strong equalising influence there. It promotes social inclusion. And that's why ministers are focusing on building up a very strong universal provision from which the, the children from poorer backgrounds will really benefit the most. Um, and... Um, that's, that's the rationale behind that. I mean, that argument could sustain, one would imagine, for um, children from looked after backgrounds and, and, and those in kinship care as well. I mean, I appreciate that those are particularly vulnerable and we've certainly had enough evidence to suggest the outcomes for them um, are, are not as good and, and do need to be addressed. But actually, it's, it's very, very tightly defined. Um, and, and while the quality of the provision clearly needs to be uh, there, there are two-year-olds who are getting access to those to those services. Um, but, but the interventions we make before the age of three are, are, are critical and therefore not to look to expand it to a wider cross-section of those who are disadvantaged seems to be a missed opportunity. certainly seems to be something that Save the Children uh, are concerned about, as I say. Yeah, I mean... Um I think the provisions in the bill, um, they reflect certain priorities and I think they, they go as far as they can within the, the current economical um, constraints that, that, that we have. Um, so I think that um, we are asking for significant changes from local authorities. We want those changes to be um, achievable and, and sustainable and, you know, affordable. So we have um, taken... The ministers have taken certain decisions about what to prioritise um, and to deliver what they can within um, the economic constraints that they're, they're working in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil Bibby. Thanks, Kimina. Um, the early, early years education is currently f funded through the preschool education grant. Um, I understand this does not uh, currently cover childcare. Um, can I ask you, uh, will the additional hours... Um, for early learning and care be funded in the same way as is currently the case? Yes, it will be funded the same way. So it will be for local authorities to secure the provision either through their own services or through um, partner um, providers. 
Um, so local authorities have, have, um, are delivering this um, directly under their education um, duties. And, and will there be an element of funding de designated for early learning and an element of funding designated for childcare? No, um, it, it, it's seen as in, indivisible. Um, it would be the same um, high quality standards of consistent early learning and childcare as, as we've defined. So um, it would be for local authorities to make sure that that um, is provided, as I say, either through their own services or through, through partner providers. Can I ask you about um, the issue of flexibility? What, what do you envisage parents um, being given in terms of the time? Um, for example, if they wanted their time over two days, would you, uh, or the 15 hours over two days, would you envisage that happening? And also in terms of days of the week, do you envisage them having the days of the week that they want? Yep. Um, there's a wide range of ways that you could... Um, cut the 600 hours or around 16 hours a week and it will be for local authorities to consult with local populations and what their needs and what their preferences are. So we haven't set, um, there's a minimum framework that um, sessions should be no less than two and a half hours a day and no more than eight hours a day and delivered over um, no less than 38 weeks in a year, although th that doesn't need to be confined to term times. But within those sort of broad parameters, um, local authorities are free to um, reconfigure services to provide a range of choices, um, and that would be up to them to decide. So it could um, be two um, eight-hour days a week. It could be um, five two-and-a-half-hour sessions, but with additional sessions in, in norm term time. It's really depending on what parents identify as their, their needs, that on that basis local authorities will, will make decisions about what to reconfigure and what choices to offer. Um, can I also ask, um, has there been any consideration given to um, some uh, partner nurseries who may uh, have financial difficulties if um, parents would like to take all of their childcare um, time in uh, nursery funded places, leaving no wraparound time that the nursery can charge uh, th their rates for? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, nurseries, um, whether they're in the private or the public sector, can charge for wraparound care. Um, they're, they're, they're free to do that, yeah. John McAlpine. Yes, just a quick supplementary in terms of... Um, it was actually in terms of Mr McArthur's point about extending uh, provision. Um, you mentioned the financial constraints. I know that in Scotland we have a higher ratio of... Uh, of carers to children in, in, in preschool and that that has been diluted um, in uh, England and Wales. Uh, and I wondered if whether you would care to say something about the importance of uh, the ratio of adults to children that we have in Scotland. Okay. Um, I think in England it was it was proposals. Um, I don't think it's it's gone ahead. In in terms of Scotland, we've checked out with stakeholders, and there's there's certainly no appetite to change staff ratios um, here from what they are. Um, and I think that's the other key thing about when, when we talk about the the economic constraints. Um, for all the changes that we put in place, we don't want to compromise in quality at all. We have to, any increase has to be in parallel with improved quality, and that's fundamental um, to, to any changes that happen. Uh, George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon. I was going to say good morning there. Lost track of time. Uh, I'd like to ask about kinship care, in particular kinship care orders. Now, I've obviously had some experiences in constituency matters and as a councillor about kinship carers and one of the things in the bill was the opportunity to be a, a residence order which is a kinship care order. Now it says here in the financial memorandum that in paragraph 119 it is expected that a proportion of formal carers will apply for a kinship care order. My question would be why would they do that? What would be the advantage to them? And uh, what would actually the, how the support offered by local authority would differ? Um, that's a fairly straightforward answer, and it comes from uh, the, the policy comes from the quite extensive feedback we've had from kinship carers. Um, they would apply um, to uh, for the kinship care order because um, the kinship care order will provide much more specific support than they are accustomed to um, having at the moment. What with the situation 
um, as things are just now, is that support provided to a formal kinship carer um, is very much at the discretion of a local authority. Um, and that's something that um, kinship carers uh, uh, find difficult. Um, and um, the incentive also for a kinship carer to apply for the kinship care order is about, um, goes back to the policy rationale, which is about providing um, an enhanced form of permanence uh, within kinship care. Um, a child who's subject to um, compulsory supervision uh, and living with a kinship carer is not in permanence. Um, and so this is uh, enhancing an existing route uh, for permanence within kinship care. Um, kinship carers tell us um, uh, quite strongly that uh, they, they, they want to uh, do the best for um, uh, the child in their care. Uh, they want a form of permanence, um, you know, such that they're not sort of constantly being monitored um, um, in terms of a corporate um, corporate parenting um, when that's not required. Um, so that's, 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 um, uh, that's the policy rationale. So there, there should be an incentive um, for them to apply for it because it's much more specific. Okay. The other thing I was wanting to ask was uh, the government's currently undertaking a review of existing kinship care allowances. Now, I know everything's not expected to come out till the end of the year, but is there any early findings that you might be able to share with the committee at this stage or for stage one of the bill? Um, there's nothing I can share at this point. I can tell the, the committee that um, the, 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 the timetable, we've had to review the timetable um, uh, owing to the, um, the complexity of the modelling that we've had to do. Um, there are a number of options that we are exploring uh, based on the work that we've done to date. Um, uh, so we've done quite a bit of detailed modelling um, and that's, that's been considered at the moment. Um, I'm happy to come back to the committee and advise them on when we can share some information about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Neil Pippen. Um, we've got the Children Act 1975, Children Act 1995 and looked after children regulations 2009 in, in, in terms of uh, that have an impact on kinship carers and local authority support. Um, wh why did you decide on including additional legislation on kinship care? Uh, is this not covered in existing legislation? And, and could you not allow uh, local authorities to apply for residency orders for kinship carers under existing legislation? Um, residence, orders, residence orders aren't um, uh, something local authorities can apply for. It's the petitioned by kinship carers um, or, or, or sort of a range of people in different circumstances. Um, we felt there was a need for the kinship care order based on the feedback we had from kinship carers and from local authorities. Um, neither uh, group um, seemed particularly happy with the status quo and part of that was to do with the, the, the continuing growth in formal kinship care which, um, based on the feedback we got, did not seem to represent um, a, a particular you know, uh, the, didn't seem to represent um, needs uh, particularly well. Uh, there, was a, there was a feeling um, that children in formal kinship care were not necessarily um, comprehensively worse off or in greater need than those on the edge of care or at some point in, you know, um, at risk of becoming looked after. Um, and that's a, that's a problem with the way the system works. Um, so we felt there was a need to enhance the route to permanence within kinship care. Um, and we took some feedback on that through the consultation process and actually in the years in advance of it. Um, and this was the, the, the best mechanism we thought we could come up with. So, so in terms of when you say uh, qualifying kinship carers um, in respect of uh, financial support, the criteria for that, which it's going to be determined um, in, or left to regulations, you're talking about kinship carers that... Um, or children that are at risk of being formally looked after. Is that um, that's or that's an yeah. yes. That's that's a consideration. What we um, what we wanted to do was make sure that local authorities had some ability to um, focus support on those um, families who who needed it most. Um, uh, so that was one test that we thought uh, about. We've put that into the. Um, documents accompanying the bill, but we think that test really needs to be uh, consulted on uh, with practitioners um, uh, through an extra piece of work, which we're running, uh, pretty, well, now, actually. Um, and there's a, there's a good reason for that, which is around the idea that um, we've got to avoid, uh, um, well, we've got to avoid stigmatising kinship care. Um, we've got to make sure it works, it's targeted, so it allows for the targeting of resources to those who need it most, given the economic constraints. Um, um, yeah. Can it the financial memorandum refers to savings being made through kinship care because of savings from children being formally looked after unnecessarily. Uh, what evidence is uh, the Scottish Government uh, using or, or have that children are being looked after unnecessarily? That came through the, um, the, the feedback we had in, uh, through the bill consultation, but also we've, um, uh, we've been working with uh, 
uh, Children First uh, for a number of years, uh, who we have um, funded to work with around sort of 43 uh, groups around the country, um, uh, you know, specifically to, to, to gather um, useful information about how kinship care works in practice. Um, and so we've been using that ev evidence uh, to, to guide our policy making on this area. Adamson. Just um, for complete clarity, because I'm a bit confused now about it, does this mean that financial support will only be given to kinship carers who have a formal order in place? Can you clarify? This... Sorry, just in terms of financial support, because the, 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 well, the, the, at the yeah. moment it's discretionary in the part of the local authority they can award kinship care whether there's a residency order in place or not. Is that flexibility been removed by by, by the bill? No, at the moment, um, if you are a kinship carer of a looked after child, um, the expectation is you will be entitled to an allowance, which covers a multitude of things. Um, with a kinship care order, we're making that much more specific. Uh, the one thing we have said, um, and we agreed this with uh, COSLA for the purposes of the bill, um, the kinship care order does not automatically extend the previous commitment to allowances for formal kinship carers. The review is looking at that aspect of things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, Neil Bibby on the school's consultation. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, convener. Um, I just guess general question that it seems out of place in the bill. Um, why has it been put into this piece of legislation? Um, it, it, it's been put in this legislation, or it's, it's proposed that it should be dealt here because this is an opportunity to deal with it quickly, because this is an area that the government attaches importance to, that there's been a, a large degree of delay while the Commission on Rural Education considered the issues, and that now the Commission has reported and the government has responded to that report, uh, we are anxious to, to move quickly. There's also the matter of a recent judicial review which has concluded and the government wants to move to clarify the legislation. This is an opportunity to do that that isn't too far removed from the rest of the bill's purpose to do with services for children. It, it's going to be added at stage two to the bill. Uh, what consultation will there be? We expect to shortly issue a sh uh, public consultation paper uh, on the amendments that we will bring forward. Um, it will be there will be a shorter time scale than the government would normally like to apply, but we feel that it's important to achieve a degree of public consultation, and there will also be an arrangement for meeting stakeholders during the summer to carry out as much consultation as possible. This will also work on the consultation that the Commission on Rural Education did, which was extensive, and we feel that the issues have received some airing through that. Can I just, clarify, just for planning purposes, in terms of the committee's work, um, when will that consultation be publicly available, the results of it, and the government's response to it? We expect to consult during July and August, and we would that would we expect to be in a position to respond to it and provide the detail of the amendments that we would propose to bring forward in good time for the session we understand you've scheduled for the 26th of November uh, to consider this after stage one. Um, so we were during the autumn. Um, well, I, that's that's why I asked, I suppose, because the 26th of November seems a little bit late to me, because clearly we have to take evidence on the bill. Um, during the stage one part of the process, um, although it's your intention to introduce this at stage two, it would be helpful if we could take the re relevant levels of evidence at, at stage uh, during the stage one part of the bill process. Um, so I'm not entirely convinced that it would be helpful for us not to know about what exactly is going to be inserted into the bill until after the end of stage one. I ex the consultation will be... We will want to allow them as much time for the consultation as we can, and we think that that will be during July and August. I expect that ministers will be happy to write to you during September to give you as much of an indication as they can of what they have learnt from the consultation, if that would be helpful. It would be helpful if we have as much information as possible from the government um, as early as possible, because clearly we have to take evidence on at, uh, during stage one in September and October. Um, and in terms of planning, uh, I, I'm thinking of the clerks in particular, uh, they uh, have to get uh, witnesses in place and we have to make sure there's enough time to, for us to um, properly um, scrutinise the bill and indeed those witnesses. This is a large bill with a lot of different areas and it is a tight timeline for us to do that as it is without an additional part of the bill. So I would be grateful if we could get information as soon as possible. I appreciate the urgency. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I thank you for coming along this morning and giving us uh, some 
additional information um, at this early stage on the bill, and I will suspend briefly. Our next item is consideration of eight negative statutory instruments. Uh, the first instrument is the National Library of Scotland Act 2012 Consequential Modifications Order 2013. Do members have any comments to make on this order? Okay. Does the committee agree to, to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-169? Agreed. Thank you. The second instrument is the Equality Act 2010, Specification of Public Authorities, Scotland Order 2013. Members, have any comments on this one? No. OK, I'll put the question. Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-170? Great, thank you. The next instrument is the Requirements for Community Learning and Development, Scotland Regulations 2013. Do members have any comments on this order? No. Uh, does the committee therefore agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-175? Thank you. The next instrument is the Adam Smith College Fife Transfer and Closure Order 2013. Uh, do members have any comments uh, on this order? No. Okay. Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-179? Agreed. Agreed. The fifth instrument is the Annesland College and Langside College Transfer and Closure Scotland Order 2013. Again, do members have any comments on this one? No. Does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-180? It's agreed. Thank you. Uh, the next instrument is the James Watt College Transfer and Closure Scotland Order 2013. Do members have any comments on this order? None. Therefore, does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-181? It's agreed. The next instrument is the Kilmarnock College Transfer and Closure of Scotland Order 2013. Uh, do members have any comments on this order? Again, none. Uh, does the committee agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-182? It's agreed. Uh, our final instrument is the Reed Care College Transfer and Closure Scotland Order 2013. Do members have any comments on this one? No? Okay. Uh, does the committee therefore agree to make no recommendation to the Parliament on SSI 2013-183? Uh, thank you. Convener, can I raise an issue? Um, it's not that, well, what is it? Just, um, today in the media we have seen allegations that this year's higher maths exam paper was dumbed down of poor quality, uneven and without flow. Sorry, it's, um, not, it's, not, it's not on the agenda, so... Uh, well, I, can, I, can I just well, raise, that, no, raise this briefly, convener? That well, it's I not think a that matter we... on the agenda, Neil, so um, this is not a platform for raising issues which are raised in the media. If it's an issue you wish to put on the work programme, then we're that's happy to discuss that's, it. That's well, exactly we, don't have a work pre we don't have a work programme item, item on the agenda at the moment, so we'll, we'll move on and we'll discuss it. At the appropriate point, uh, we have previously agreed to take the next item in private, so I therefore close the meeting to the public. Uh, this will be the committee's final meeting before the summer recess. Uh, so therefore, can I, uh, my, can I uh, welcome uh, the fact that we are reaching the end of what has been a, a long uh, and uh, complex series of, of meetings on some difficult issues, and can I thank the committee for their efforts.
over this last session. Thank you.